Introducing ISO Color Edge. Precision is essential for any professional working with images. Whether you're an artist, a retoucher, or a visual effects specialist, you need to know that what you see at the start of a project is precisely what you'll get at the end. Color Edge monitors give consistent, reliable accuracy that guarantee no surprises within your color workflow. So what you see in real life is what you see on screen, and what you see on screen is what you see in real life. That's precisely why professionals all over the world trust ISO Color Edge for their image creation. ISO Color Edge. Discover living, breathing color. Canton Beretta Photographique is a silky smooth satin paper reminiscent of traditional darkroom Beretta prints. It offers excellent black density, probably the highest on the market, uh, together with great image contrast and detail. Uh, one of the things I'm often asked is how Beretta differs from Platine Fiber Rag, a similar paper. And it differs in two distinct ways. Number one, it, it's definitely a smoother paper, and also it's an alpha cellulose paper, whereas Platine Fiber Rag is a cotton-backed paper. Uh, now, Beretta does contain some natural brightening agents, and I say natural because it's inherent in the barium sulfate coating that gives Beretta its beautiful finish. Uh, but it's still considered a museum grade paper and meets all industry standards for longevity. And really it's a paper that works well with a whole variety of images, color of course, but it especially shines with black and white where rich blacks and deep contrast is important. So if you're fond of darkroom prints and you want a paper that has a rich satin finish, then Beretta Photographique is definitely one to consider. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon if in Australia. Good evening if you're in other parts of the world. Good morning, wherever you may be. We are beaming you live to the global community of astrophotographers. My name's Andy Campbell, and I'm delighted that you're here. We're going to judge the astro landscape category shortly. And what we're going to be seeing are the best of some prejudged images. And when I say prejudged images, three of our expert panel have already seen all of these images, scored them out of 100. They then got averaged, and the highest 28 are what we're going to be assessing now. We don't care about what the scores were before anymore. We've now blank slate, and we're going to start all over again. So, category preamble. Astro landscape category. Astrophotography images taken back on Earth that depict a feature or element of astronomical interest in which the night or twilight sky is a prominent feature with a landscape element. Any image containing terrestrial foregrounds will be considered an astro landscape image. 
star trails and images of noctilucent and nacreous clouds, halos, meteors, you name it, could be entered into this category. The integrity of the subjects must be maintained and the making of physical changes to the landscape is not permitted, i.e. removal or addition of fences or trees or other astrophotographers with too high tripods. Composite images are eligible for entry provided that all elements of the photograph, i.e. sky and foreground, were shot in the same location. We have scrutinized these to avoid the misuse of AI processing, which is not to say you can't use AI processing, but if it's overdone, well, we may have called on you. Um, these entries are submitted as digital entries. We have requested for the following information, date the image was taken, location the image was taken, telescope, camera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, we are very, very grateful to our sponsor, Sidereal Trading and William Optics, without whom we could not have presented this fabulous event. And one second. And we'd like to acknowledge and thank Diego Colmello from Sidereal Trading, who is here as one of the judges today. Um, sorry, you had a question? Just the same location. Um, on our fabulous judging panel this afternoon, we have Dr. Tanya Hill. We've got an actual astrophysicist. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Tanya develops award-winning planetarium shows for the Melbourne Planetarium, working with a creative team of people to tell the stories of the universe. The planetarium shows they produce are licensed to planetariums around Australia and across 20 countries worldwide. Amazing. You can also hear her on uh, the radio, inspiring people to look up at the sky. She lectures at the planetarium. Um, and prior to that, she carried out research in the field of extragalactic astronomy, where she hunted for super supermassive black holes using a variety of Australian telescopes. Dr. Hill is an honorary fellow of physics at the University of Melbourne, an honorary fellow of the Astronomical Society of Australia. And so, anyway. You get the idea. <laughs> um, next to um, Dr. Tanya, we have Paul Holan, Grand Master Photographer Paul Holan, uh, originally from New Zealand, resident in Tasmania. Uh, Paul has won everything there is to win in Tasmania in landscape photography, so much so he's been banned from it forever. And has uh, graciously joined us uh, on the panel here today. Um, also a master photographer in Australia and zillions of other accolades, I'm sure. Um, Michael Sidonio, better known as Strongman Mike, well-known Australian amateur astrophotographer and award-winning astrophotographer with a background in strength athletics. He, is an, he was an actual strongman. Uh, he studied astronomy at the Dixon College and worked at the Canberra Observatory for over a decade. Uh, once retiring from strongman competitions, Michael focused on astronomy and astrophotography. His work has been featured in many exhibitions worldwide and featured several times on NASA's astronomy photo of the day. Michael has made significant contributions to astronomy research and he's even discovered a galaxy 11 million light years away. Michael also has recently finished the completion of the construction of the highest privately owned astronomical observatory in Australia located in the Tindary Mountains. <laughs> there you are. And um, amazing place that it must be. Harry Rex, a Canberra-based, originally Albanian, <laughs> I'll get this right, uh, nightscape, landscape photographer of uh, note who has won zillions of nature and landscape awards for his work and runs fantastic nightscape workshops. If you're interested and if you're in the area there, check out Ari, he'll set you out with how to do this amazing work that you see here. And finally, but by no means least on this panel here, um, we have Grand Master Photographer, twice Australian Professional Photographer of the Year, Honorary Fellow of the <laughs> Australian blah, 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 all that stuff, Peter Eastway. For producer of Better Photography magazine and all round good guy. That's good. Thank you. Uh, coming back to the bench shortly, but not here yet, we have uh, Tim Moon, president of the Mossman Camera Club, multi award winning astro uh, 
landscape photographer and ex exhibited worldwide, et cetera, et cetera. And I've already mentioned Diego, but what I haven't mentioned about Diego is he's twice a finalist in the Insight Astronomy International Photographer of the Year. Right, got all the preamble out of the way? You're all good, okay? <laughs> and thank you for coming. Okay, you've had a bit of a look at the slideshow. We could probably stop that now if that's all right. You're all logged in, you're ready to go? Okay, we'll go to the first image and you may need to just hit refresh on your device um, there. You are welcome to get out of your chairs and have a close look at the image should you wish to. We can't zoom in on them, can we? And what, and what do I do here? And is there some information for me to read out about this one? There's the description. Can I read it? Can I see it? Show me. One moment, I'll give you the description. Okay. Just hit me on the. You sure you want to read all that? All right, go ahead and read. <laughs> Can I have the microphone for a moment, please? For. Oh, it's over there. It's over there. Okay, description of this image. Double helix after the main aurora display on the 24th of April. Died down. I was amazed to see the STEVE -E appear in the east and travel directly overhead to the west. I quickly repositioned my tripod and shot this vertical pano from the eastern to western horizon. I feel blessed to have been in the perfect position to capture the STEVE. -E just off to the left of the lighthouse and the Milky Way, just off to the right. The STEVE became so bright to the naked eye, it blocked out the Milky Way. And wasn't until I started stitching this, this pano that I realized they crossed paths directly overhead. Image was taken on the 24th of the 4th, 2023. Location, Nugget Point Lighthouse. Telescope. Tamron 24 to 70 mil lens, camera Nikon D750, exposure 15 seconds at 4000 ISO, 2.8 aperture and 24 millimeter zoom. Um, All righty, scores please team. Waiting on your score. There you go, no, I'm struggling to get in. So I've got a feeling that I was logged on as uh, scribe before. Aha. Uh -huh. And now I'm trying to look at about blank. Just while we're waiting for your score to come through, this will be an average score of um, all the judges combined that I'll announce shortly. here you could uh, welcome to use. How's that bottle of red wine looking now? No problem. Let me just log out of this one. 
see if I can log out of this so I can get you back in there. Okay, gone. Okay, this is now log out. Okay, Peter. Um, look, I, they've got they put their scores in. So just, so just log yourself in there and carry on, buddy. Will that confuse it's these guys though? Got Possibly. Here, if you want to. Kay's got you. Uh, sorry. Right. The normal service will be resumed shortly. And now we could try again. Um, now that's going to be a problem on our account because it's not. Kay, can you log in, Peter, as me? Would that work? No. <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear. Um, so, Peter, what's your. Um, okay, so here I'm back in the game now. Well, when right. I do that one. Yes. Where do I go? So, is that sort of my profile? Up to there? Go here. No, you're, 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 you're where you need to be. Um, oh, you haven't registered for the competition I yet? I have. Okay, all right, don't stress. Back to website, one moment. Let's see if I can figure this out. Okay. Have you got it, guys? Awards portal, checking. Oh, dear. Okay, click the button. No, it says that Peter hasn't registered for the competition. Um, that's all I have there. Which is interesting, Can I give you because I've also entered the competition, so... Now, <laughs> the only thing that's going to happen... Yes, please. for a minute just to chat. <laughs> Mike, can I get you to fill in some time for me while we deal with a technical issue? Yeah, absolutely. I'm can, you, just can you tell us a little bit about uh, your recent build? Oh, I think I might leave that for this evening. What do you reckon? Well, you've got a live stream audience here that uh, oh, may okay. not be here tonight. You won't get to see it now, will you? <laughs> oh. Yes, well, uh, uh, you were talking about my observatory. Hmm. Yes. Um, Pretty much finished now. Took uh, about 18 months from inception to completion. And it's a wonderful location to capture the universe. I feel very privileged. And every time I'm up there, I look up and think, I can't believe this. This is really quite incredible. So uh, hopefully a few people over time will get to come up and experience the same joy. You're a lucky man. <laughs> I, I definitely am. And I don't forget it. I still pinch myself. Could you pass the mic over to Dr. Tanya, please? Ta Dr. Tanya, what's happening at the planetarium? Hello, what are we doing over there? Um, we've just been through a very busy, wonderful school holidays. And at the moment, we are running our black hole show, which is one of my favorite ones, because that was the, uh, based on the research that I did when I was a PhD student searching for supermassive black holes in distant galaxies using all the different telescopes across Australia. And, uh, and then me personally, I'm working on a new production for us that will look for the search for water in the solar system. So that's kind of what's mostly filling my head at the moment wow. is uh, where are all the different places? And it's incredible. It's quite surprising where we've ended up finding water and just how much water is out there because we often think of earth as being the blue planet the water planet but if you look at some of the other moons and locations across the solar system we find out that in fact there are places that have even more water than what we do and uh, of course water is so important to life 
It's just, a, it's so intriguing what else might be out there. So it's, it's pretty good for a day job, really. <laughs> Can I ask your uh, thoughts on the possibility of something interesting in the seas of Europa? Exactly, that, that is one of the places, the seas of Europa, and we'll, more I'm going to delay that because, of course, the European Space Agency just launched its latest mission, JUICE, which is going to look at the uh, moons of Jupiter, including Europa, um, so it'll be a few years before it gets there, but I think that's when we're really going to be able to understand what's going on. But, I mean, what excites us from an astronomy level is that it's got the three key ingredients. It's got water, it's got energy, there's activity there because the moon is in a tug of war um, with Jupiter. And then there's uh, most probably, a, I'm not sure if it's clear for Europa, I know for Enceladus, which is a tiny moon around Saturn, and the Cassini spacecraft flew through the plumes that this tiny moon was uh, erupting and showed that it's salty water, so it's got the ingredients for um, where early life could develop. And really, if you've got those three things, I think it would be kind of crazy if there's not some sort of complex chemistry going on, which is quite exciting. That's just so cool. Paul, what's happening in Tasmania? <coughs> or more correctly, you've just come back from I was, was going to say, you might have to ask someone else. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've no, just no, been the, to the Arabian Desert and Iceland and the um, Arctic Circle and uh, Norway and um, Amsterdam. But uh, it was pretty telling being in the Arctic for the first time and getting a real real life witness of, of climate change, you could argue. And um, Svalbard is the fastest changing place in the world and some people would say up to six times faster than anywhere else on the planet. And so I felt special to be up there and, and to document you know the polar bears and different sort of species who who are facing a very very challenging future and uh, it was a real privilege to be there but i also like to try and use my photography when i can to support you know scientific and conservation kind of methodology so making it available and being very present and thoughtful at all times about how you can potentially contribute which you can all do to some extent so I'm a little bit behind. It's been a really beautiful year of um, aurora um, happenings in Tasmania and it's getting a little bit stronger with the, um, the movement towards solar maximum coming up in 2025. Just the last month or two has been a little bit quieter, which I'm not un unhappy about because I wasn't there. <laughs> uh, but it started ramping up and it was, uh, for a while it was just feeling like every, every few weeks there was, and sometimes three times a week you could be heading out and... What's beautiful about the position of Tasmania relative to the polar regions is because we're so distant from the, the auroral oval, we actually get to see all the layerings all the way through to its greatest height. So we get such a complex layering of colours and features and a lot of ease of, of, of leaning into, um, you know, having it lower in the sky as well lets us lean into the terrestrial foregrounds a lot more and, and let the galaxy sort of features play in a little bit more to the compositions and blending them together. So, so it's not quite as overtly bright to the naked eye maybe as some of those regions, but funny enough, when I was in the Arctic, I actually realised I would have had to be facing south to shoot the Northern Lights because I was so far north, I was almost 80 degrees, and wow. I wasn't expecting that. Wow. But of course, it was uh, 24 hours of daylight, so if it was on, I would have known, although somebody suggested my, my drone might have started playing up if there was a big, <laughs> big aurora going on. So privileged to be in little old Tassie, it is quite a magnificent part of the world, some of the clearest skies, certainly the cleanest air on Earth, uh, scientifically proven, so always a battle with cloud, that's the main challenge but we've been really lucky that we've had um, a lot of clear nights a lot of still nights and and a lot of she's been dancing for us beautifully so looking forward to more so you're going back again oh yeah i just just got home a week or so ago so uh i'm already uh i've already got the radar out and i'm usually at this stage after going out so many times my stuff's just sitting by the door <laughs> ready to go so amazing <laughs> and I, there's such a big community of people engaging with it like there's a Aurora Tasmania Facebook page, which is like 180,000 people in a place that has a population of about four or 500. So it's kind of like the interest level is huge. And I was on the paddle for the uh, Aurora Chasers Handbook, which just got brought out recently, the, the volume two. Uh, and it's really um, a testament to the, um, the depth of interest and, and the level of inclusive and supportive community around that type of photography is really, really special. It's not competitive, it's really uplifting. Everybody wants to support and help each other out to get out there and learn more and, 
evolve and and like today again you know as much as I'm a photographer I, I have lots to learn about the physical representation and, and the scientific methodology and today especially some of the technical understanding about how people like yourself Andrew you know engage with these um, deeper space uh, mm. compositions in particular so yeah privileged to be here thanks for the invite Andrew thank you mate I think we are back now we just need to get this monitor back up online it's just fallen over um, we have an average score of 90. That makes it a finalist. Straight away, our first image. Boom. <laughs> now, because we're on 90, we can challenge this. Because we have three of you in that 90 range, and I'm going to use my executive powers. <laughs> because you're not five points away. But um, you are 94? That, that was you, right? 95. Yep. 94, yep. Oh. You, you, are the, you are the highest, so you can speak. Go ahead. Uh, oh, um, yes. There it is. This one? Yep, and we'll just get you the picture back so you know you can talk about it. There you go. Thanks, Karen. There you go. I, I find this beyond the astro category an astonishing piece of visual communication. I, I see like a a DNA helix of the binding forces of, of humanity and the universe kind of just represented in, a, in a, um, a magnificent form. You know, listening to the description, how that timing wasn't necessarily even uh, planned in terms of that wonderful crossover and that swirling kind of matrix that runs through. And there's this lovely solid base to the bottom and the detail is all there and the, and the shadow details handled beautifully and there's that sense of poise and groundedness and yet we're just being led out to fly to infinity and beyond through through this wonderful vertical spaciousness that gives us all this room you know all the technical things are handled wonderfully uh, and to reinforce that base there's, there's a cooler palette down the bottom but I also find that spatially moves us in a different direction because the cooler tones tend to pull you back and the warmer comes forward so there's almost like this extra twist on this uh, this plane sort of visually sort of straight on it's 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 a magnificent piece of, of visual communication I, I love it thanks Paul now um, Peter and Ari aren't quite there with you Ari could I get you to speak on this one please um, yeah thank you <laughs> yeah so this is uh, an amazing I image it's very um, it's not that easy to capture to, to come across uh, Stevie I call it like uh, this uh, unique phenomenon the only thing that uh, let me down just just a tiny bit. It's uh, just a little bit of a noise on the blue part of the image, which is a bit distracting. Uh, the the noise on the on the on the blue part of the image on the clouds. It's very subtle, uh, but yeah, probably the photographer yeah, uh, can can probably yeah, fix up with just a tiny bit of local. Uh, noise reduction. Right. It was a bit, yeah, that's all. <laughs> Thanks, Harry. Could you pass the microphone over to Dr. Tanya? Do you prefer Tanya or Dr. Tanya? Ten Tanya is fine. fine. Thank you. Tanya, you're up there supporting Paul with his score. What are your thoughts? So certainly, I feel like the positioning of that, a lot of luck is involved, but I think that also shows that for someone to be able to capture it and be ready to get it like that and to create such a beautiful image means that, yes, it's luck, but there is that undercurrent of obviously completely, you know, being able to know what they're doing and to grab that opportunity. And that's what I find really captivating about it. And also from a scientific point of view, these Steves are, are something relatively new and this phenomenon that we don't know much about it and to be able to visually see it as that gorgeous double helix and to be fortunate enough to picture it like that I just find it quite captivating. Thanks, team. You're, you want to say? No, you good? OK. Um, I'm going to ask you to all rescore that print, please. So you may all change your scores as much as you see fit. Um, I'm not trying to influence the score. I'm just asking you to listen to the debate and give us your thoughts in keypad format. You're good now? Hmm? You're good now? I'm here, yeah. Everything's yeah. Works, so. Thank you. I just think that um, your wife has sabotaged me. Mm. 
All right, how are we going for scores? Who do we not have? And if the uh, entrant is out there sweating, <laughs> waiting for their final <laughs> score, we send our deepest commiserations. As be we'll, be, <laughs> we'll be faster on the next one. Yes, exactly. <laughs> there it is, I believe. He has done that now. We now have 91 solid finalists. <laughs> Apologies for the technical glitch earlier. Could we have the next image, please? Where do I get an exchange? <laughs> Can I have Tim back? No. Okay. All right, next print, please. Next image. He's not sending anyone yet. Okay. Technical information. Just getting the feedback. Okay. okay, microphone, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Here you go. Okay, description for this image. This image was captured in late autumn when the Milky Way appears to rise behind this eye iconic and culturally significant Ayers Rock. All stacked images were taken in one imaging session without moving the tripod. A media per permit has been acquired to submit this image for this competition. Date, May 17, 2023. Ayers Rock, Northern, Terri Northern Territory was the location. Voigtlander 35 millimeter F2.0 was the um, mm -hmm. aperture and focal length, and the camera was a Sony A7C, and the exposure was two hours. There you go. You've got it all. Um, I think I might need to step away from No problem. That, yep. Sure no problem at all. Step, you step off, and um, Diego, can you come up and jump in for this one, please? Tanya, yes. can Diego yes. borrow your device to score this one? Would that be all right? So, Diego, if you could score that one for me, please, mate. And if you're out there in live stream land, we encourage judges at any time to step off the panel in the event that they may think they know the entrant or perhaps uh, you know, show some bias towards the image for any reason at all. Uh, we just ask them to uh, step quietly away and we find one of our bench judges to step in their place. In this case, this print has scored 85. Currently, that is a semi-finalist. However, <laughs> uh, you're at 91, Diego? Yes. Great, you get to challenge this. Please, talk to the print image. Brings me emotions. Um, that rock being the heart of the country and, and seeing the, the Milky Way popping out of it, being the center of the galaxy, I think it was a job, an outstanding job by the photographer. Um, in this case, this punctuation um, relates a bit of what I feel when I see it and the technical difficulties on what I see on the screen, which is a great quality on the um, uh, Milky Way being portrayed that way. The colors are running on the processing of the image. That's why those points. Excellent. Thank you, Diego. Uh, Peter, mm -hmm. you're at the other end of the 
scoring range. You were just out of that at 79. Yeah, I guess um, it depends on our background and where we're coming to the, the image from. Um, I agree that it's a great location, it's a great subject. I find it hard to divorce myself from all the other images I've seen taken of this place. So I have a, a background that's informing me. And as I look at the image, the, the composition, everything's great, but I find that the, the colour and the tonality is perhaps a little bit muddy. With just a little bit of post-production, that image could really lift a lot more. So from a pictorial point of view, I find the image is perhaps a little bit dull and not as bright and vibrant as I'm expecting it to be. Now, the photographer may have intended it exactly as it is, but I'm the judge and that's why I haven't quite scored it up there because my way of seeing would be as a pictorial image, um, I would like to see a little bit more craft and thought from the, from the, the, from the uh, creative side, I guess. Paul, could I ask you to speak as well, please? You've given it right on the average score there. Yeah, I'm, I'm sitting there mainly for compositional reasons. I think it sort of falls away a little bit distracting off to the right-hand side. And, and I've seen, you know, again with Peter, I've seen quite a few images of this particular place. And, you know, further back with a vertical line, or there's, there's lots of different opportunities to, to create more graphical strength and um, symmetry and, and or balance, I think, visually, uh, compositionally. Um, Diego, you have right of reply. Back to you. I consider uh, th there is an art on processing images and popping out those colors, um, being subtle. It, I consider it harder of cranking the slider and popping out the colors and saturation in certain cases. So um, in my side, I, I value the, the fact that he didn't overprocess the image and that he didn't want to pop out all these colors that in, in other cases I consider unnecessary. But that's why. Wait, so I got five of us. Correct. All righty. Right. Thanks, team. Thanks, Diego. Your score is locked in at 91, so what I'm going to ask you to do is re-enter 91. The rest of you are free to rescore your the image. And where the winner is... And the print score is 86, solidly into the semi-finalist range. Thank you, Diego, for stepping in for Tanya. Could we have the next image, please? I wonder if there's any way I can get to read this. I can't see it, it's too dull. Is it, can we make it dull? Screen? In the meantime, I think it's you. Oh, hang on. Um, this image was captured in late autumn when the Milky Way appears to rise behind the iconic and culturally significant... Yes, that's the same image. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> we'll get this right in a minute. There we go. Yep. Okay. On my recent trip to New Zealand, I was lucky enough to witness a spectacular sight, a moon halo caused by moonlight passing through ice crystals in the atmosphere. This amazing display was made even more beautiful by the unique geological formations of limestone boulders. These formations were shaped over time by weathering and erosion, providing a perfect frame for the moon halo. This is shot at Castle Hill, New Zealand. Uh, 15 to 35 mil Canon 2.8 lens on a Canon R5, ISO 4000. Thanks, team. This print has scored 88. <laughs> However, <laughs> Ari, <laughs> you've given it a little bit more than that. Let me give you the microphone and you can perhaps tell us what you think. So, yeah, this, <laughs> the reason I scored it, uh, I'm at 95. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, this, the, the moon halo, is, it's incredibly uh, harder, to, uh, really hard to photograph and uh, frame it right with uh, other subjects around. So uh, I, I, I've photographed this myself and uh, uh, it's, it's highly, uh, the image is uh, very well 
executed and with that foreground uh, details and textures and the leading to the to the to the moon it just it, to me this is like poetry <laughs> i really love it so uh, yeah uh, right, let's, let's hear from peter eastway his score is a little lower than that yeah, no, I was on 83 and I liked it for all the reasons that you've presented and it's just a matter of scale and I'm wondering whether I'm going to be tarred with the uh, brush of being the hard old bugger on the, uh, on the judging panel this afternoon. Thank you for inviting me, Andrew. Um, I, I, I agree. I think it's great. Um, we do talk a little bit about degree of difficulty in capturing the image and I'm possibly not putting as much emphasis on that. I'm figuring that we're in sort of, you know, advanced if not professional awards and so if there's a degree of difficulty that that doesn't really impact me so much, but then again, I, I, I'm ignorant. Uh, but I look at it visually and I find it very strong. And uh, that's why I've called it a, a semi-finalist. And we're using the same language, but we're coming from a different base. And that's, that's just where we are, I'm afraid. Yeah. Yes, Paul, you're, you're actually, you've given it 88, which is the current Yeah, I'm score. in the middle. I, I may consider coming up. I, I feel like if you look closely at this file and how incredible the detail is visually through every single pixel all the way to the back of frame, the sharpness in particular, which is always a great challenging factor when you have a huge depth of field shooting with wide open apertures in particular. Um, the wonderful design and the shape, the perfect positioning of that bow and how it just, just hints into the rocks and almost the rocks become a part of that circular feature in the background. And this lovely kind of leading line for the middle just walking out into the frame and the way that exposure's hand of shooting into the light is exceptional. I think I just talked myself up to finalists. Good, Good go. go. <laughs> I think you've just given Ari his right of reply, actually. Ari, anything more to add? Um, not really. It's all been like, said. Like, how, how can right. you... You know, <laughs> let's, let's, uh, but, uh, oh. yeah, I'm, 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 um, I'm really interested to see uh, how you guys will, uh, are going to rescore right. this, like, right. uh, once again, I say that, like, it's, uh, it's a great image and very well executed in post-production and capture and, uh, artistically, you know, to me it ticks all the boxes. Thanks, Ari. I'll ask you all to rescore this, except, Ari, I'm going to ask you to put your original 96 back in, please. All righty, team, how'd we go? This image now scores. Is it? Yes. This now scores 90 and is a finalist. Every point counts because whoever gets the most points, which is ever image gets the most points in this category, wins it. That's it. So you keep fighting. Well done. Could we have the next image, please, Paul? I believe you're needed somewhere. You need to go to um, step off with Chris. Um, Tim, are you with us there? Mm -hmm. Tim Moon, could you please come and join our astronomical yes. panel? Uh, Tim, just hold you on a second. Thank you, team. Can we have the next image when you're ready? You're ideally placed for this panel, aren't you, Tim? Tim, 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 Tim Moon. <laughs> Please. Okay. Iceland, March 2022. The goal was to capture the aurora over the Kirkjufell mountain. Um, feeling peaceful under the night sky with the lady aurora. Image taken with a Nikon 14-24 f2.8 on a Nikon D850, six second exposure.
Thanks, folks. Uh, Ari and Mike. Thank you, team. We have an average score of 87, solid semi-finalist. And here we go, it's popped up now. I think we will accept that score as everyone's scores are very, very close and we don't have anyone who's more than five points away. That being said, I would like to get a comment, please, from do, 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 Mike Sidonio. Can I give you the microphone? Uh, what, what struck me about this image was the striations in the top right-hand corner are beautifully offset by the strata in that mountain. It could have been any mountain. Uh, any mountain would have looked good. But that's what particularly caught my eye. There are a lot of uh, aurora, green aurora photographs that you know, we've all seen. And it takes a bit to, for something to stand out. And for me, that was the first thing that I noticed. It's beautiful striations, sort of angled left to right on the top of the mountain, the strata in them, and then these striations in the aurora at the top right. And then right in between, you've got these beautiful curving, misty curtains. So a lovely image. Um, I think originality is probably the only thing that's... Uh, I've seen so many green aurora shots that something needs to stand out, and that certainly did. But uh, overall, I think it was a, an excellent photograph. Thank you, Mike. Could we have the next image, please? All righty. This is interstellar, capturing the awe-inspiring beauty of this sacred land and its connection to ancient traditions as the fulfillment of a long-awaited journey. Interstellar not only captures the epic beauty of this desert location in the night sky, but also the personal sense of wonder and accomplishment that comes from checking off a long-awaited destination. This area is sacred to the Noongar people, the traditional owners of this land, and in the past it was accessible only to women. The story goes that these limestone rocks are nothing but petrified ghosts of the men who dared to enter and were then eternally punished by the gods. Oh. Sorry. It's a pain in the pain in the roof drop there. No, that needs to kind of stop refreshing. Uh, this image is taken at Numbung National Park, WA, Australia, uh, using a star tracker and a Canon 15 to 35 on a Canon R5. The exposures, there's 18. Uh, two minute exposures at 1250 ISO, tracked, and the foreground is 10 half second exposures at 2000 ISO. Could we have your scores please, team? All right, this print has scored, image has scored 88, solidly in the uh, semi-finalist range. And you are all almost of one mind with your scoring on this one. You're very, very close in this case. Ari, I'm going to ask you to comment, but not challenge on this one, if that's OK. Um, it is a lovely image in, in a lot of aspects. Uh, aspects. Um, it's framed beautifully, the Milky Way, uh, considering capturing them um, in the middle of, of summer, uh, getting that um, part of the Milky Way, it's, it's a very high quality image for capturing during that time of the year. And yeah, this, uh, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful image. That Barry, what would help get this one perhaps, the extra few points to get that finalist? Do you think? I'm, I'm, um, I'm on 92 on this one, so to me it ticks everything. So. Okay. Well, it's, uh, uh, it's just one of those images, I guess, that um, is, is excellent. Yeah, excellent on well executed in, in well executed. capture and, and okay. subtle editing. The colours are 
not overdone or anything. Very good. It's, it's good. Like please, yeah. please, Peter. Just, just in the post-production at the end, just a little bit more contrast in the foreground would just give it the strength of the base and then the sky's going to hang off it a little bit better. It's just so close. Um, and so I understand what you're saying. It's, it's a beautiful image. Just Thank a you, Peter. That's yeah. Excellent feedback. Could we have the next image, please? All righty. What we have here is, oh boy, Yggdrasil. I'm attempting to pronounce that correctly. Mount Barker, South Australia, Sam Yang 12 millimeter fisheye lens, Nikon D810A, exposure 30 seconds at ISO 3200, and Yggdrasil is the world tree, says the information. Just waiting on yours, Mike. There it is. Thank you. This print has <coughs> scored an. Uh, this image has scored an image. Uh, uh, bleh. This. Image has scored 88. Well done. Once again, you're almost of one mind with this image, with your scores all in that range. Uh, that said, could I get a quick comment from Tanya, please, on this one? Thanks, Tanya. Yeah, th so this image, it's lovely the way the Milky Way has been captured and you can really see the dust lanes running through. What I found quite interesting about it though is the way the tree has been captured, that it leads your eye up into the Milky Way and that kind of composition I haven't seen before. So I really found that quite unique and lovely. Thank you very much. And we'll go to the next image, please. Alrighty then. Uh, this end result is 343 photos over 85 minutes worth of satellite images blended together with a low light level photo used for the foreground. Taken at the Pinnacles in Western Australia with a 24 mil lens on a Sony A7. 15, 15 minutes, 15 second exposures, yes, we've mentioned all that. Right. Just refresh if you can't look. Have, have you put your score in? No. Okay, just refresh and it might let you back in. I've got your score, Peter. Okay. I'm just waiting on Tim. Do you prefer Tim or Timothy? Timothy. All good. Thank you very much. <clears throat> This print has scored, image has scored 89. What's the challenge options here? Yippee. Ooh. I know he does. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to challenge yourself? No, no, no. I'm, I just want to make you a comment. I've got a solution for it. Go, Carl. But, uh, <laughs> well, let's, let's, let's discuss the image. Let's, sure. let's, let's call a challenge then. Um, Mike, you're the highest in this case at 93. I'd like you to speak first, if that's okay. And I'll give you the microphone so you can. Maybe you guys can just keep it over there. Okay, what, um, what draws me to this, this photograph is I could be standing there. So what we have here is a, a not a stretched entire sky that's had a foreground put in front of it because it looks good. You could actually stand here. That's the sky. That's how much of the sky you'd see. That speaks to me. The other thing that speaks to me is a termite mound. 
with billions and billions of ants doing their thing, totally oblivious of the universe, pointing straight up. It also shows what human beings are doing and how they're ruining our night sky, which is only going to get worse over time. So this clearly, clearly says that, and it really speaks to me because I cannot stand that fact and that that's happening. So it's probably a bias, maybe, I don't know, but also like the, the element of the human is on the left, which I'm assuming is a, a town out of the frame, which once again says this is what humans are doing. Ants aren't, humans are. So it has a real message. It's beautifully composed. I love it. I'm going to call on Peter to talk on this one because you're right on the cusp. <laughs> you know, I, I, I wanted to give this a, a finalist and I went up and then I was just found that that termite mound was a little bit soft. Now, I don't know whether it's depth of field or whether it was image shake or focus or whatever it was, but I love that sky. I mean, that sky has just got that etching feeling. I know it's a bad thing, I know, but I love it as a, from a graphic point of view. But this could be fixed. If you go to Topaz Image Sharpener and put it in there, it will sharpen up that termite mount. And if only you could put it in next year and then win a, a, a finalist there. But it, I, it, that's the only thing that just held me back. I hope I'm right and that's not my eyesight that's letting me down. But if that termite mind were, mount were sharp, um, it would be way up there. I'm going to ask you to pass the speaking stick over to Tanya, please. Tanya's in, uh, score is in support of Mike's. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I feel like this is an image that I wish we didn't, we couldn't create, but I feel like it's something that everybody should see, that this is, this is the problem that we're causing, and yet it does have that artistic element, which is absolutely beautiful. So it's kind of an image that terrifies me and I also find absolutely beautiful at the same time. It's a little bit frightening thinking about what uh, Elon Musk's doing up there for us all at the moment, isn't it? Just, just on yeah. that. He's doubled the amount of active satellites within two years. Holy so there's now 8,000 active satellites, let alone all the inactive debris, rocket debris, orbital oh gosh. debris. Yeah, if we get up to 40,000, 80,000 satellites up there, we're in trouble. Back to you, Mike. You're uh, right and I think, is it, was this Western Australia this was taken? Yes. Yeah, so it's also poignant because the square kilometre array isn't that far from this, where this was taken. And the same millions of satellites are ruining their observations as well. So we're losing the radio sky and we're also losing the optical sky. So I love and hate this image. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's rescore, folks. Uh, Mike, you can keep your score, please, in this one. But I'll need you to re enter. I, I think I'm challenging it. So. I'm letting you challenge as a re I'm letting you rescore. 93. 93 for you. How are you going out there, audience? You guys getting something out of this? You happy? You're very quiet. Interesting. There's a bar All righty. This print the image has gone up to 90, so well done, folks. It's now a finalist. <laughs> All righty, um, next image, thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, we have a HARGB tracked panorama, 92 total image integration. The night was vlogged for my YouTube <laughs> behind the scenes on how this image was captured. You can find out that information later, but it was, t it was taken in Coonabarabra in New South Wales using a Sigma Art 41.4, modified Sony camera, astronomic 12mm HA filter. All the exposure details have been provided. Um, suffice to say that it's impressive in the number of captures. Um, the motivation was to show how man-made structures change over time under a sky that remains the same. The windmill was built in 1918 and the concrete tank sometime after that and in recent years the solar pump all under a sky that remains timeless due to the portal one sky for this image. I'll get you to score the image please folks. And this image has scored 87, solid semi-finalist. Your scores are, oh, you can clap. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it's a very good score, of which you are all very similar in this instance. Um, 
But in this case, I'm going to ask Ari, because he's dying to speak, <laughs> <laughs> what might push that one over the line to a finalist, Ari? The only thing that uh, let me back on this image was uh, just a bit that, that uh, red, um, red light on the, uh, on the bottom left of the image. And um, that's, yeah, the, the headlight or probably from the tracker, there's a soft uh, haze on the, on the left light. That for someone, it might be a bit subjective. Someone might uh, look at it as a, you know, a leading point. But uh, yeah, that's the only thing that let me a little bit down. So uh, could be fixed on post-production, on post-edit, so to lift it a bit more. Thanks, Harry. I wonder if you could help me with something. What is that area there? Can anyone identify what that is? Uh, I think it's a haze from like, kind of the, the haze. It, it doesn't look like it's from post. Okay. Post Thank you very much. All righty, folks, we've had a good chat about that one and we've scored it well, so let's go on to the next image, please. Okay, this image is taken at Castle Hill, New Zealand. Um, it's a panorama. Um, and we are seeing a speechless spectacle, a lunar halo, moonlight reflecting off ice crystals, illuminating magnificent limestone boulders, adding majesty to an awe-inspiring scene. Uh, it's taken on a Canon R5 with a uh, 15 to 35 mil lens. Folks, this image has scored 85. It's a very solid semi-finalist. All your scores are very, very close. So I'm going to ask Tim for comment, please. Sure. Um, on ways to improve or? Right up next. On, yes, on ways to perhaps improve the image's score overall. Okay, uh, interesting composition. Love the curve in the foreground. And uh, just the positioning of the moon in that, that uh, composition. Uh, the thing that held me back was uh, when you looking close around the, uh, uh, the horizon line around the rocks, there's some blue fringing. And that would just indicate that maybe um, your selective um, masking just needs to move a pixel or two just to get rid of that. So uh, that little fine detail around the edge of the rocks and sorting that out would certainly lift it. All righty. Um, yeah, go on. I was just going to suggest maybe a crop top and bottom just to get a little bit more flow left to right uh, with, with the panorama might make it stronger compositionally. Thank you, Peter. Uh, we'll have a quick judge change. Tim, could I ask you to step out for a moment? Diego, could you come and join us on the panel, please? And Diego, don't log in or do anything strange until Dr. K says you can. <laughs> so what do we want to do? Judge the image first and then... Okay. So, so look at the image first. So go to the next, so. next image. Yep, it's coming. Here we are. So Diego, hop up and have a look at the image and then I'll get you to try and log in after that. Uh, information on the image? <coughs> Excuse me. All righty. Uh, this is taken at Breeza in New South Wales on a Samyang 85mm 1.4 with a HA modified Sony. There's 245 images in total. Tracked, sky blended with the foreground. The night was vlogged for the YouTube channel, so you can go and have a look at the entrance uh, YouTube later on. Uh, and this old barn was built as a set piece for the Superman movie. Uh, the Entrant wanted to challenge what was possible in a nightscape image, so instead of shooting a panorama with a wide-angle lens, 
uh, they decided to shoot the full arch with an 85mm lens. The image size was 5 gigapixels. Did it mention that? Um, just that, that it was the uh, set for Superman. So I could ask for your scores, please, folks. You sent it? Thank you. There we go. This image has scored an average of 86. Now, if my calculations are correct, Ari, you are invited to challenge this one. You are five points away from that average at 91. So I'll get you to speak to the print, please, sir. It is a a beautiful image, very well executed. The subject is uh, its very nice. The Milky Way capturing that position again, um, it's, it's quite hard to capture the, the full arch of the Milky Way on, on that side, so on uh, almost east from uh, the top. I kind of really enjoy also the image has got plenty of space all around. Um, it's, it's quite a captivating image. So I'll be interested to see. Um, Thanks, Ari. Yeah. We'll get some feedback from Tanya, please. Again, I agree. It's a fantastic image. And I, I love the placement of the Milky Way is really great. And also, in fact, even the way you've got the spiral, the, the curve in the um, ground, and that mirrors the Milky Way is lovely. I think, to me, it's while the position of the building is really great, it's, I feel that, that it, there's no mystery. There's no, it, in some ways, it's just, it's there. Uh, and so that's what I find is, is lacking. I don't know the technical way to... Um, put forward any, any suggestions, maybe someone else on the panel can, but I, I just feel that it, it, it's a lovely image, but it just lacks that little, it's, it's a bit too in your, your face. I... Thanks, Tanya. Uh, Peter, I think you'd like to add something to the debate? Well, just, just to pick up on you, Tanya, I think maybe the, uh, w the term I would use is it's a bit overlit. And when we look at the foreground there, there is no mystery. And imagine that with, you've got the right-hand side of the barn, leave that lit, darken down the left-hand side, you've got some direction, darken down the foreground. I, I look at a lot of astro work, which is absolutely gorgeous, but I just wish sometimes the astrophotographers would go and learn a little bit more about the history of landscape painting and how light can really inform and create that mystery that you're talking about, because we're all basically humans at the end of the day, even me. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Ari, your right of reply if you have something more to add. Um, not really. Like, I'm just curious okay. to see um, if the, this image can go. Let's, let's rescore this image, folks. Ari, you're locked in at 91. Please re enter your 91. And our score now is 87. Score, score is now 87. Solid <laughs> semi-finalist image. Could we have the next image, please? You guys good? Yes, sir. The image looks a bit soft. There were so many. Oh, I'm just. I, I, it was just, just off the. I'm just. Oh. You might know the image was a bit soft. Yet it's huge, and I just wonder whether in the reduction size process, the photographer might have not pressed the right. But I don't. I don't know. I just mm. can't understand why. Because even the background's not so good. The background in the middle. I mean, I can't be out of focus. Mm -hmm. So it's just an interesting question. Could be a compression issue, perhaps. Yeah, that's weird. All right, team, let's go on to the next image now. 
Alrighty, folks. The next image is up there for you. Um, MOA underscore LL under the MOA2 under the stars showcasing the MOA2 telescope at Mount John Observatory, the largest telescope in New Zealand. Very few people are able to capture the telescope at night as the observatory is closed. The entrants spent their summer working at the observatory as part of their engineering internship. So it was able to not only photograph the telescopes, but also use and maintain them. Mount John Observatory, Nikon Z50, Astro modded Z6 camera. This is a 50 panel mosaic of 60 second exposures of the MOA 2 telescope. Alrighty, folks, thank you. This image has scored 89 and is very close, very, very close to a finalist. So you guys are all of one mind. Does anyone, are you, are you, you want to challenge this? Because you're really close. You're on 92. Go ahead and challenge. And I'm allowing that because two of you are in that range. Well, I think it's only fair. If, you know, if we've got the guts to come and give it a finalist, we should be able to talk. But I'll take that up with the administration mm -hmm. later on. Um, I suppose I was almost um, channeling Turner and uh, his use of colour and paint and light and colour as I'm looking at that sky. And I find it you know, quite... It's emotive, it's perhaps interpretive, it might not be real, I don't know. I'm imagining that that time someone has certainly played with the saturation slider, but it, in terms of giving me an emotive response, so I'm, again, we're not talking about mystery so much as I can see most of it here, but it's very picturesque. And in this section here, I'm, I'm congratulating the photographer. Uh, the, tone, the, the colour on the observatory itself is neutral, which means that the colour in the sky stands out. I'm of two minds of the road and the little um, the, the post, the yellow post, it sort of adds and it detracts at the same time. When it goes into uh, oblivion like that, no, we're back on tap track. So for me, I, I just felt that as a, uh, as a landscape, it was worthy of a finalist and a, a, a chance at the, uh, the pot of gold at the end. All righty then. Now, you're all really close in scores on this one. Um, Tanya, you're just out of the finalist range. And I can very easily be persuaded uh, to move up. It's, it was a hard call. I actually really like the road. I like the placement of that and, and how it leads up. And it's really used the cloud and uh, the inferno type um, emotive is, is what comes to me. And I suppose in some ways I may well have marked it down a little because of the telescope. It's um, not because I don't like it, but because um, I suppose where, where was I? I love the placement of it and the, the lighting, but maybe it was just, yeah, it's, it's an interesting one, but let, 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 possibly. Let yes, yeah, <laughs> exactly. There's a really interesting way that they framed the telescope mm -hmm. under the arch under that, of that, the Milky that, Way, which is place. containing it quite beautifully there. And it's like a little tour of uh, all the cool emission nebula in the Milky Way there, isn't it? Um, Peter, right of reply. Um, oh, sorry, Diego. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Ari, go ahead. Um, yeah, this is beautiful. I totally agree uh, with uh, what has been said. The, the, the only thing that I would suggest probably to, to the photographer, this image has got great details in the uh, foreground. There's a bit of saturation on, uh, on the, in the sky uh, because of the haze might have uh, helped that, that saturation going up a bit. But uh, the foreground, it might have been shot in blue hour or during the blue moon, which gives a, a bit of a, a blue cast in foreground. And to me, it didn't match, um, in my way of thinking, the foreground with the sky. So I would suggest to the photographer probably uh, dial back that blue in the foreground. And this image would, 
would be in another level for me, but I'm still willing to go uh, up a bit because of what He's, Peter said. He, he can have that. one more crack and see if he can <laughs> tip you over the edge. Well, yeah, well, I'm not actually wanting to tip you over the edge because we've got to be individuals here, but uh, I think I've said what I wanted. I think it's really strong. I, for me, it was a, a finalist because of its painterly rendition and it's a, um, a non-scientist here looking at it and saying I could be convinced to try and understand what the hell those scientist people do actually talk about from time to time. All righty, folks. Thank you, Peter. You can lock in your 92 and the rest. Uh, actually, you can rescore it. You can rescore it because I oh, challenged that one. Thank you. No, See, I'm that's not. what Kay's for, to keep me on the straight and level. Thank I'm you, Kay. I, I don't Doing want to um, influence the panel. So feel free to uh, score the image, <laughs> folks. Thank you, Kay. Yeah, we're just waiting on Ari's score to come in. There it is. Print scores finalists now at 90. Could we have the next image, please? So is there quite a lot of coloration or is that filter that he used? Sorry, I need the information. Hey guys, need you to just listen up for a moment, please. Uh, this is a tracked panorama of the milk. Way. <laughs> um, the image, uh, what have we got here? HA modified Sony. This is 100 exposures. The foreground was focus stacked. And this is Canola, a popular springtime landscape image. The photographer wanted to see golden yellow leaves under the golden dust of the Milky Way. Uh, due to using the 40mm lens for the panorama, the entrant had to focus stack the foreground. And utilising the blue hour to capture the foreground so they could limit the movement of the plants. The old barn is a perfect subject to centre the frame and symmetry was the aim of the image both in colour and shape. Shot at Breeza, New South Wales. Scores please team. Just waiting on yours, Mike. Thank you, mate. Uh, just refresh if that doesn't let you in. This one has averaged 87. I bet you will. <laughs> I'd expect nothing less at 95. So uh, you're, you're working with 85, 87, 86, and 84. So I'll find the talking stick. No, that's okay. This is where judges are different and I, uh, I suppose I, what I love about this is just the immediate visual impact. Um, you know, the central uh, composition I love, I, um, people say you're supposed to put things over on the left and the right, I actually think that there are many opportunities for a central composition to work brilliantly well. I love the vignetting up in the sky, which isn't in the foreground, so it's obviously an intentional device. Um, the use of colour is very strong, it challenges us, it's not really a night sky in some ways, it's, a, it's an almost a, 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 an outer worldly sky, and uh, I'm... Yeah, the number of exposures there, I'm just figuring we've got a compression issue or whatever we're looking on the screen. Um, I'm assuming that that barn is actually tack sharp to some extent. It just spoke to me and that's why I gave it such a high score. But I can understand you guys um, down a few marks lower than me and that's alright. But if you'd like to join me, that's okay. But uh, I, I, I don't know what else to say. Either it speaks to you or it doesn't. Well, let's, let's hear what Tanya has to say then and see, uh, see what happens then. Okay, uh, so certainly the, uh, the colour, colouring of it captures it really well. I think to me though, my eye gets drawn to the, it was canola, um, yeah. isn't it? That, and uh, so needing something that actually lifts your eye up into the sky, I don't feel like the barn, the barn is beautiful in the way it is centred in the middle, but... I am not, that's the thing that's pulling it back for me is, where, is where's that lift up to enjoy the magnificent sky? Oh, 
I'll, I'll get Mike to do this one if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> okay, obviously there's no, no doubt this is a beautiful looking image. For me, the, it's the context. Um, the Milky Way is an entire galaxy. It's massive. It covers a whole sky. goes from right behind you to right in front of you. The barn is a barn. It shouldn't be challenging the Milky Way. For me, it challenges the Milky Way way too much to make this a finalist image. It needs to be a barn. The Milky Way is the subject. The Milky Way is the hero. So that's all that I would say. And I mean, you know, that's... It's, Moderately minor things. Only the reason I didn't give it a finalist type score because to me it wasn't in context. Thanks, Mike. I'll get you to pass back to Peter for his right of reply. Yeah, no, I think the comments are valid. I would, uh, if I were doing it myself, I'd also darken the bottom a little bit so that the eye is led in there. Um, I don't have the same issue with the barn and the, um, the the Milky Way. I love the way the two work together, but it's our backgrounds that inform us differently, and that's why that's why we've got five judges. So uh, thank you. Alrighty, thanks, team. I'm going to ask you to rescore the image. Uh, we are getting a little shorter. Uh, along, sorry, I'll get this right. We need to we need to be a little quicker on our deliberations and debates, if that's okay. So um, scores, please, team. Thank you, Peter. You're locked in at 95. You've brought them up to 88. Well done. <laughs> Could we have the next image, please? Thanks. All right, this is a single shot. A cropped moon rising over the sea level under the Milky Way, taken from Tom Murray Mountain Lookout, New South Wales. And it's 20 second exposure at ISO 5000 using a Canon 6D and a 15mm to 30mm Tamron lens. So I'll ask you to score this one, please. Just waiting on yours, Mike. There it is. Thank you very much. This print scores 89. It's really close. Um, so we've got 89, 89, 90, 92, and 83. I'm going to challenge this one because it's so close. We better just sort it out. But I'm going to get it sorted out quickly. Ari, you're first. Thank you. This uh, fantastic image, to capture it with a single shot and bringing all together the, uh, all the elements of the sky and the foreground. And that tree just, yeah, <laughs> yeah the photographer has shown a lot of um, high skills in, in capturing and also the editing is very subtle. So beautiful, I could look at it forever. Uh, it's a beautiful image. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say. All right, Diego, do you have anything to add just about this image? My opinion is that it is all I want to see in, in, in my educate, not uneducated way of uh, an astro image, a single shot, everything super sharp, well processed. Um, that's what I see on that image. Everything is in the, the balance, the way it's composed it, and that's why my point. Okay. Mike, quickly? Just very um, quickly, for me, it's a believable image. Again, I could be standing here, that could be my backyard, and I could be the happiest man, even happier than Eagle View. Up in the tinderies. If I walked out my backyard and I stood on my veranda and saw that, I know that may not be a veranda, but that's what I'm thinking there. Beautiful natural colour. Taking in one shot is unbelievable. Beautifully composed. Excellent image. All right. As I challenge that one, I'm going to ask you all to rescore now, please. image now scores, by majority, 89. <laughs> so, looks like uh, we'll stay at semi-finalist level for that one, folks, but so close. Well done to the entrant. Next image, please.
Uh, the dead trees off the shores of Lake Tulondo always make for moody scenes. These two seem to me to be guardians of the galaxy as the limbs reach right to the core of the Milky Way. This is uh, taken in Victoria, Australia at Tulondo Reservoir. Uh, 14 to 24 mil Nikon Z on a Z72. Multiple 15 second exposures stacked. You guys all good? All right, Diego, we like you too. All right, just waiting on the mic. Thanks, team. This image has scored an average of 87. That's a solid semi finalist score. Once again, your scores are all very similar. Does anyone desperately want to challenge this one, or are you happy to let it sit at 87? I think we'll leave it sitting at 87 in that case. Thank you. Uh, what we will do, though, is we might grab a comment. Comment, yes, I was about to say, we'll get a comment from Harry, because I know he's dying to. Yeah, and no, I just, uh, ahead, um, it's a beautiful image. Uh, my compliments to the photographer. Uh, the only thing that, um, yeah, um, the photographer has used uh, the, um, quite a bit the, the, the noise reduction, so, and has lost a bit of details in the Milky Way, so that's the only thing that um, I suggest to uh, be careful with those sliders on uh, noise reduction. That's all. Thanks, Ari. Why am I using that? I've got this. Next image, please. Uh, this is Mitre Rock at uh, Mount Arapiles in Victoria. Tracked Milky Way panorama over Mitre Rock. Light pollution from the nearby town of Horsham can be seen on the left side of the image. Uh, taken on a 40mm Sigma lens with a Sony A7 III modified camera. 21 images stacked for the foreground, two minute exposures. And the sky is uh, 60 tracked images of 20 second exposures. Alrighty then. So, this image has scored an average of 87, solid semi-finalist score. Well done. As the scoring is so similar within the range, we won't challenge this one, uh, but we will call for a comment from Tanya, please. Thank you. I'm, the foreground in this one, I think, is really beautifully lit and to capture that kind of that it's there but at the same time the hero is the sky and I really love the inclusion of the H-alpha emission to bring out that redness in the Milky Way and to see beyond what we would normally see with our eyes. The colours of uh, Roa Fuchi Ro <laughs> yep. are quite beautiful in this yeah, as well. Lovely. Let's go to the next image please team. Alrighty. Uh, the image is a 270 degree panorama, two rows, one for the sky and one for the foreground, using a homemade panorama head on a tripod, a Canon 6D, image taken at Boreen Point in Queensland. And what we're seeing are three strokes the emu chin. <laughs> taken in, taken there, I'll get this right in a minute. The iconic marriage tree overlaking, overhanging Lake Kutharaba on a beautifully still night with the Milky Way arching over the tree. 
those with a keen eye might see the emu in the Milky Way with its neck curling over the tree with some twigs stroking the underside of the emu's head, adjacent to the Southern Cross on the right. Let's get your scores. Just waiting on you, Miss Eastway. Thank you very much. Alrighty then. Well, we're straight into an average of 90, so it's a finalist. Don't no, think. No, no, no. no? Oh, I beg your pardon. It's that clever average um, majority. Okay, it's a majority 89. It's an average of 90. We are going to sort this one out though because. We have a 97 in there at Ari. So Ari, I'm gonna get you to speak to the print, please. Image, I'll get that right one day. This image just speaks, uh, speaks to me in so many ways. Um, it's, it's just so well executed. The photographer is like, uh, <laughs> he knows a lot about many things, not just uh, you know, uh, technicalities and, and uh, art and everything. <laughs> But um, yeah, the image is, is ex execu executed so, so good. And there's so many things there that can uh, let down the image, uh, like the highlights of the back uh, uh, behind the tree. And he has used that as a, uh, uh, as a, well, a beautiful light to, to, to make the, that, that tree. That It's an ordinary tree, but it's, it's created so beautiful with the Milky Way. There's a lot of stories in, in this image the reflection of the Milky Way in, in the front, the way it flows from left to right, um, the subtlety, it, it is a night image. It, like, this is just uh, spectacular. I really love it. Let's hand over to Peter, whose score is a little less, and Ari, let's not assume that the entrant is a he. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Look, look, Ari, I, I agree with what you said, and I, it comes to a matter of degree. I, I think it is beautifully executed. Um, my, my background, I guess, when I look at the image is that, as strong as it is, um, all the curvature of the panorama and all of that, I don't know whether that's actually enhancing the landscape for me, which is unusual for someone like me who doesn't believe in reality at all when it comes to photographs. But I just find that uh, it, it works really well and I've scored it, in my mind, a good score, which is you know, a, a semi-finalist, not a finalist like you, so it's just a matter of degree. Over to Mike. Mike's uh, at the higher end as well. Yeah, so um, what I like about this and what it illustrates is illustrates to me is when you're trying to take a, a photograph of everything around you, just don't forget what's in the foreground is all around that photographer, what's in the sky is all around that photographer. So to believably get that into one frame without cheating, that's how you do it. This is a really good capture of everything around you and displaying it accurately. So that foreground is everything around them, it's not a truncated or narrow field of view that's been put in front as a foreground, in front of a 360 degree panorama of the Milky Way. So that's a real image. The other thing that I love, the shape of the water matches all the shapes in the sand. Also the shape of the water looks like Australia. So this, this, it just speaks to me. I think like Ari, I could be there. The lighting's natural. Haven't, he has an over, or she has an overlit the tree. It's, it's a really good image. I think it's, it's deserving of a finalist image. Alrighty, Ari, has it all been said? Uh, yeah, but okay. I totally agree with uh, yeah, uh, Mike. Right. Like, once again, the photographer is like, you know, uh, uh, it's showing quite a lot of, of techniques here. And, the, you know, light pollution is one of the, another thing that uh, it's a big problem for uh, taking astrophotograph uh, astrophotography. But he has used that. Uh, Positively, like there's a back, you know, the light of it's light in the foreground that comes from um, some light from the back, that kind of, uh, you know, houses or street lights, oh. and he has used that um, so well Thank on, you, on Ari, connecting that's... everything. So, I'll, yeah, uh, this for me sits uh, really, really high on on uh, final. All right, you're on 97. You can lock that in. And let's see uh, what happens when everyone else rescores this image. <coughs> and the winner is... 
This image now scores 91. All righty. Uh, Ari, we're going to have a quick judge change. Tim, can I ask you back on the panel? Ari, can I get you to swap out with Tim Moon, please? While that's happening, we'll go to the next image. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's have a look at the information. All righty, folks. The band of the Milky Way forms arch behind Mount Cook and Mount Tasman, Plateau, Hutt, and Hochstetter Glacier feature in the foreground. So the Plateau Hut, how do you pronounce that? You're from New Zealand. Ayaraki. <laughs> Ayaraki, Mount Cook National Park, New Zealand. Thank you, Kay. Uh, Ayaraki, Mount Cook and Mount Tasman are the tall, two tallest mountains in New Zealand. Lie beyond the Plateau Hut and the Great Grand Plateau each peak towering well over 3,000 metres above sea level. As the glowing band of our home galaxy, the Milky Way, begins to set in the west, forming an arch across the horizon like a blanket over sleeping giants. Air glow in the Earth's upper atmosphere also adds vibrant reds and greens to the skyline. So, let's get some scores. Um, Tim, are you logged in and everything? I am there. Thank you. Um, New yes, Zealand. Zealand. <laughs> I apologise to all the New Zealanders listening to us right now. Uh, this, print, this image has scored 85, solidly in the uh, semi-finalist range. <laughs> Tanya, could I get a comment from you on this? Tanya, could I get a comment from this? So what I really find fascinating about this photo is the way the Milky Way, the arch of the Milky Way and the way the, the neck of the emu, to the, so towards the left, um, moves downwards on that diagonal, is matching the peaks of the mountains mm. as you go through. I think for me what detracts from the image is actually the air glow. It's adding too much vibrant colour in a scene that may well have been beautiful as a um, blending up into a, just a really dark, deep sky that you could get lost in. Next print, next image, please. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, to Londo Reservoir. To Londo, Victoria, Australia. Taken right before the Milky Way disappeared into blue hour on a silent, foggy morning. The dead trees scattered throughout Blake to Londo create an eerie yet beautiful scene under the stars. A Sigma 50mm 1.4 art lens on a Nikon D850. It's a 13 frame single row panorama. one's going to be interesting. <laughs> we have an average of 89, uh, we have a score of 90, and we have Tanya at 96. All righty then, you get the challenge. <laughs> <laughs> this is definitely an image that speaks to me in that I feel it Really, you, you, we've lost the barrier between where is the ground and then what is up in the sky, where is the foreground and what is up into the sky with the, um, the beautiful fog, and then matching the colours of the sky to really draw out so you just have this lovely... Uh, again, I don't know the technical photography terms, but to me it's a really a lovely colour palette that's being used. The symmetry of the trees, it's so stark and beautiful. I, I just want to fall into this image. 
Uh, Tim, you're the lowest scoring in this one at 81. <laughs> Look, I, I can agree with the... Um, it's fantastic conditions, fantastic having that uh, mist on the lake and wandering through the trees and having that uh, fantastic celestial background. The thing that just holds me back is the, is the contrast haloing around the trees. It's just too much of a distraction for me. And I'm just wondering whether a crop might help, but uh, fantastic conditions, I agree, uh, but the, uh, just those haloing around the trees is just too much. Uh, Peter Eastway, you're also in the... Oh, I love the haloing around the trees. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I'm not, I mean, I, I just think of uh, Caspar David Friedrich and uh, his, uh, you know, his hay hose, uh, his hay -hose. <laughs> but it's a painting and uh, that's what I'm responding to as well. I'm not quite too sure about the, uh, the technical side and whether there's enough pixels there or whether the image we're looking on the screen is a little bit stretched or whatever, but I just think from an emotive point of view, it, it's way up there. So you're not alone up there, Tanya, at all. I reckon it's great. And I think it automatically got into the finalists, didn't it, on the majority score? It's there. Yes. Yeah, fantastic. Great. I don't have to say anything more. No, Tanya, back to you. Back to Tanya. Oh, yeah. so she, so Tanya, so she can finish her conversation. Oh, oh, you've said enough? All right. All right. Let's rescore, folks. All righty. Image now scores 90 in every range, every way possible. Alrighty, definitely a finalist. You guys good? Yeah, good. Alright, next image please. Alrighty, Nugget Point Lighthouse, Catlins, New Zealand. An amazing display of lights um, initially, sorry, just reading and just seeing what's relevant to the image. Um, Aurora Australis at Nugget Point Lighthouse. Two rows of six images shot at 24 mil. Uh, Nikon D750, Tamron 24 to 70 mil lens. Uh, 10 second exposure. Yeah, well, it says here two rows of six images. So, uh, shot at 24 mil, 4,000 ISO. So, yeah. Oh, I see. 10 second exposures for um, ISO 320. That's, that's the, that's what it is. Yep, got it. So it's, <coughs> Two rows of six I images. Let's talk about the image after we've scored it, folks. Please. Okay. Image score is 84. Solid semi finalist. We will take a comment on this one from you now, Mike. Because <laughs> you want to talk about it. Yes, what was interesting, I was trying to work out whether the foreground was actually um, a 360 degree panorama bent around. It doesn't appear to be, it appears to be a bay. Oh, because it's a very lovely photograph. Um, it's very gentle. Um, I like the lighthouse on the left. Uh, I think the, the foreground's nicely, nicely lit. Uh, it just had that overall really nice look to it, but it didn't jump out at me and grab me. Um, otherwise, excellent. Next image, please. Thanks, Mike. Okay. A full spherical 360-degree panoramic image of our little planet surrounded by northern lights. This is a full spherical 360 degree panorama in stereographic projection. The image consists of four shots at 90 degrees 
and one zenith shot. It's taken at Westfjords, Iceland, using a 8mm fisheye lens on a Sony A7R Thanks, Mike. This image averages eighty seven solidly in the semi finalist range. You're all pretty much of one mind. Do you want to take it on? You're happy? Yeah. All right. Um, in that case, I'm going to... Who wants to comment on this one? They all sat back. <laughs> Come on, Peter. Give, it, give us a... Give, us a give, the, give the entrance and feedback. But the image has got some fantastic impact, and it's the technique that's being used that has created that impact. And my challenge to the entrant is that if you did another 10 shots like this with that aurora, what would you do differently in the foreground? In other words, what's underneath, what the earth is? Because I think if you had a different standpoint, you're going to say lots of reasons why you couldn't be anywhere else. But I just find the middle of it is what lets me down. The surroundings is fantastic, but in a pictorial context, I think the centre of the image needs to have something different, something more. I expect as a stitching exercise that would have been quite a challenge to have put that together. Uh, in this case, the entrance done a fabulous job of that side of it. But thank you for your comments there. Let's go to the next image, folks. Alrighty, this is a tracked panorama showing the full arch and faint air glow. Uh, it's taken at Coonabarabran in New South Wales, Sigma Art 40 mil lens on a HA modified Sony. This is a 47 image panorama. Taken at grazing land under Bortle One Skies in Australia, first dark sky reserve in the Warren Bungles National Park, New South Wales. The entrance suggests that this is the kind of thing that people drive past every day, but what does it look like at night? Oh, welcome back. Thank you. Um, Prince, the image average is 84. <laughs> and as you're all almost of one mind here, um, Tanya, could I ask you to comment on this one, please? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Again, it's the use of the foreground and the lighting of that, and I feel like there's a good scale balance between the, the tree and lifting you up into the sky and the way the Milky Way disappears into the air glow on either side just creates a really lovely composition. Thank you, Tanya. Could we have the next image, please? Okay. Just hang on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Blue Mountains, Australia. Explored beyond tourist spots in the Blue Mountains to uncover thrilling adventures and witness stunning nightscapes embracing the humbling experience under nature's vast sky. Uh, this is an automated tracked panorama and using a Canon 15mm lens and a star tracker, a Benro Polaris. Is there an HA difference for background background? Foreground sky? Oh, sorry, it's just disappeared. Hold one sec. It says the sky is 16 photos tracked and the uh, 800 ISO 24mm. Um, the foreground is 10 photos stacked, so yes. So let's see what your scores are, folks, please. Got to round you up a little bit here, because, yep. uh, you know. I had network error. I don't know, see if it works. There's a um, chap on the panel who's delivering a um, keynote presentation tonight, so uh, we've got to give him time to, you know, do that. <laughs> well, 
Oh, are you out? Uh, okay, Peter needs some help. Still got circle of death there, Peter? Yeah, I've refreshed. It's just what they said. Uh, well, I've got signal, so I don't know what its problem is. Sorry, folks, we seem to have a bit of a technical gremlin. Oh, phone's good. Oh, the gun's coming in. Oh, he's back. Back. Shake it. <laughs> Got nothing. All right, let's try again. That worked. Well done. Perseverance. This image has scored 87 and is solidly in the semi-finalist scoring range. And you are all on your own. I'll let you know what you're working with. You've got a couple of 88s, an 85 and an 83. Over to you, sir. Well, I think uh, in this instance, um, we've got a, a unique composition, and that's what I'm enjoying, is uh, something I haven't seen before in the way that it's presented. Um, we have some issues with the foreground maybe being a little bit lighter, but just the composition there with looking down the valley in that isolated tree sitting on that rock there, it's, uh, it's something I haven't seen before, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm uh, responding to that. Nicely done. Mike, you're a bit lower than that. Yeah, look, it's a fantastic image. Um, for me, it's a bit like I said, I commented on one of the other images, that the Milky Way is an enormous thing. It's an entire galaxy, and it just looks a little bit like it's been placed there. Uh, the, the canyon itself is too, a little bit too grand for me, but beautiful photograph, but I'm just not feeling the believability in this one for me. Uh, it seems a little staged and a little composed, even though it probably isn't a composite, um, but still an excellent image, and the colours in the Milky Way really are very good. They're very um, natural looking, but it's just that feeling. Yeah, I can't stand there and imagine I'm seeing that. Not quite. Diego, just quickly, got anything to add? I'm a disabled, you are. Um, it's not what I believe I would see if I was there. I would have given more, more protagonism to the Milky Way in, in the photo. But, but I like the canyon, but I wouldn't make it as big. That's only my complaint about okay. it. And, Tanya, something and else? I would just like to add, that's one of the reasons I like this photo, is because they have played with the scale. And I think this time, sometimes you can play because you end up kind of with a full circle end up happening there, which uh, I'm really drawn. The galaxy is the top loop of the circle and then the canyon completes it. And so, yeah, it's interesting. Back to you, Tim. I wonder what would have happened if the photographer had just lowered the camera a little yeah, bit to yeah. get that tree on the horizon. A little bit you higher, on the, but then you wouldn't have the outline on the, uh, on the top of the, uh, the knoll there, mm. sitting down yeah. below. So... Um, well, I've heard what the others have to say, but you know, my my passion's more with the composition than than the grandiose nature of the Milky Way. So I'm happy with that uh, with that compromise in the image. Let's rescore, folks. You're locked in at 92. Alrighty then. Thank you very much. We now have a score of. 88, well done, every point counts. <laughs> Tim, on that note, I'm going to swap you out if that's all right for a moment. I'd like to bring Paul Holland back to the panel. Paul, you still with us? Hiding over there in the corner? You get to hold it. Oh. Good evening. Thank you, Tim. Oh, speaking, speaking, thank you. Just a reminder for you lovely people out there, uh, Mike Sidonio will be giving us a pre keynote presentation this evening, uh, next door. Um, I'm sure Mike's got plenty to talk about. You've heard all his words of wisdom so far. So we look forward to your presentation, sir. Next image, please. All righty. So, how do you say that again one more time? Ayaraki? Ayaraki. Ayaraki National Park, New Zealand. Uh, the Milky Way rising over the Ayaraki National Park from the Tasman Glacier viewpoint. 
Uh, Nikon Z7, uh, foreground is 12 images at 18 mil. The sky is 27 images and it's tracked with a Skywatcher Star Adventurer Pro. Camera is a Nikon Z7. All right, scores please, team. image has scored 87. That's a very solid score. Your scores are all very, very close. Uh, so we'll retain that score, I think, at 87 in this case. But we will get a comment from the judge who scored at 87. And that's you, Diego. <laughs> Speak to the print image. Congratulations to the photographer. Um, I like his idea and, and, and the fact that I see the, sorry? The photographer's idea. I like the photographer idea. Um, it makes me feel I'm in another planet. That's what I feel about the photo. I would have liked to have a bit more clarity on the Milky Way. Um, hence, that's why my, 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 my qualification of it. Excellent, thank you, Diego. Uh, could we go to the next image, please, folks? Alrighty, Lake Tyrrell, Victoria. Star trail images with the photographer in the foreground over the mirror reflection of Lake Tyrrell. Photographer has said that as spectacular as the scene was, it needed some foreground interest, and the only thing around was me. So a <laughs> selfie it became. <laughs> 77 star images and one foreground image. Star images of 30 seconds. Scores, please. Diego, Mike, Paul. Oh, okay. That's, that's usually the sign when my kids log on to the internet at home. All done. Yep. Thank you for um, turning up. It's, uh, obviously, you've taken over the gremlin. Still waiting, guys. Sorry. Have your scores managed to get through yet? Yeah, they should be. Can't see the blue circle on the screen. There you go. Come on. Thank you. There's probably other people judging the nearby. Bang up there. We got it. We got it. It's coming through now. This image has scored 87. And we will take a comment from hmm, Diego. You're on 88. I'll get you to speak to this one, please. Who's got the talking yes. stick? There we are. 
the star trails brings me into the position where the person is looking at the sky. I um, would have liked to see a bit more symmetry between up and down. That's only a personal preference. Um, star color and execution, I believe, is good. The, the reflection idea, it's excellent. Um, and I believe I would have liked a lot to be there with that person. That's what I like about the photo. Do you think as a photographer, perhaps, if the photographer was crouching down, perhaps not cutting themselves in half here with the horizon may have been a stronger image? Yes, you're right. Now that I imagine it, it, it would be a valid point, yes, that's correct. Just a thought. Did you want to add something quickly there, Paul? Yeah, I feel like they're almost symbolically connecting the two sides of the image by positioning them there, Andrew. What I feel a little bit awkward compositionally about this is the position of the horizon. It's in this awkward kind of off-centre but not quite centre sort of position. But at the same time, I recognise you'd, you'd lose that central reflection above and below. But it's, it certainly feels a, a hint off balance for me compositionally. Thanks, folks. That's excellent feedback passed on to the entrant. Let's go to the next image. Alrighty, Brayshaw's hut under the full arch of the Milky Way. Brayshaw's hut at Namadigi National Park in the ACT. Sigma 35mm art lens, five rows of 11 exposures, 13 seconds per shot, ISO 6400. We can only judge what we see. Wow. I know sometimes when you've got a 4K monitor there and you're sending a 2K file, I don't know what they've got and what they've put in, but I think you can guess which two. I hear you. The image scores 88. That's a solid semi finals. <laughs> All righty. Um, so, Peter, I'm going to get you to comment on the image because you kind of did. <laughs> so I think in terms of uh, tonality and colour um, and light, this is exquisite. My hesitation, and we're a little bit behind the scenes, is just, is the subject tack sharp? And I don't know whether it is. The file that we're looking at at the moment, at least the file that I'm looking at, and I've asked to see it in large, is just a little bit soft, and that's why I couldn't put it into the finalist range. If it were tack tack sharp, and apologies to the entrant if it is tack tack sharp, but the file we've got at the moment, or the file that's submitted, is just missing that beautiful image, lovely light. Thank you, Peter. Next image, please. Kuna Barabra, New South Wales. This image is a HA RGB tracked panorama taken under Bortle One Skies, which is the perfect location to capture not just the Milky Way, but the intense gravity wave air glow that is present. 31 image tracked panorama. Samyang 24mm 1.8, modified Sony with astronomic 12mm HA filter. So this image has averaged 83. So that puts it in semi-finalist territory. And sorry, my screen, there it is, it's back. 
I'm going to ask for a comment because you're all very close in your scores. Literally, there's only a couple of points uh, between you all. So, who haven't we heard from for a little while? <laughs> Lovely. Sorry. Uh, it's a lovely shot in terms of you get the feeling of the expanse of both the landscape and the and the sky above. And while getting all of that air glow in another image might be really great, but I feel in with this foreground it detracts. So that would be um, yeah my feedback. I think I don't. I don't think that adds to the image, unfortunately, in this case. Could you, could I ask your yeah. professional advice a little bit here? What is intense gravity wave air glow for those, you know, listening in at home? So, so pretty much what it's about is the fact that you're getting the ripples there in the, uh, this is what I believe, in the, in the air glow. So the air glow is the yellow and orange towards the horizon, and you're actually picking up the ripples, like a ripple on a pond. Uh, and so that's... That is an interesting phenomenon, but I don't think in this case it enhances the image. But it is an interesting phenomenon, not one I've yes, seen absolutely. too often absolutely. in Absolutely, and, and you know, well done to the photographer too. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, next image, please. Uh, okay, Lake Tyrrell, Victoria. Tracked Milky Way panorama of an old bus at Lake Tyrrell. Uh, nine images of the foreground, 30 second exposures. 40 tracked images of the sky, one minute exposures. Mike, I don't have your score. Yes. Thank you. Now I do. This image is scored 86. Currently sitting in semi-finalist range. Ooh, hold on a second. <laughs> you really want to take this on, don't you? I can tell. Well, yeah, I would like to take it on. Where's the... Where's the device? There it is. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll challenge this. You, I, you're working with 88, 83, 86, 82. Okay, well, let's get it up a few points anyway. I, I'm, I'm up in the uh, finalist range because I've been pontificating all afternoon about how the sky should sit in with the landscape and work together. And for my money, the sky and the landscape gel very, very well. Um, I like the coloration in there. I like the fact that we've got the, the subject, the back, the foreground, is it's got the right balance of light and contrast, etc. It's very arresting. And for that, I commended it. I find it very pictorial. I can see that, you know, from an astro point of view, that maybe the Processing up there is perhaps you know, softened off a few bits and denoised and all that sort of stuff. But you know, for a painterly rendition, I find this uh, delightful. And maybe I'm just an old bus. Oh, good on you. Oh, bus fanatic. <laughs> <laughs> good on you, uh, Tanya. You're uh, at the other end of the scoring range. Could I ask for your comments, please? Yes, and I I do agree. I feel, however, I don't think they sit as nicely together. I, if, I think if you had each separately, it works well, but I don't get that same reaction of bringing that they, they, they're in harmony. I feel like there's a, a, it's jarring in some way. Paul, back to you. Uh, sorry, over to you. I'm, I'm a little bit more on <coughs> Peter's side of the bus. Uh, I do feel like the pictorial element is really quite magnificent and the tonality and the way that the tonal range is handled on the bus in particular places it beautifully and there's a lovely sort of extra depth by that linear kind of framing that, that pulls you down um, back into the frame as well. I sort of felt a little bit distracted by the, the, the big green sort of uh, elements on the right and I wasn't sure if the, the, the bottom part of the foreground sort of supported it or, or took away a little bit because it's, it has less interest but I do feel like it's it's beautifully placed with a lovely sense of breadth and space. 
Over to you, sir. You started this show. Yeah, well, that's right. I, I, I don't disagree. It becomes a, uh, a matter of detail. I mean, the category we're in, we can't necessarily go and clone out some of those things. I'd have a field day with this and some of the other categories, but uh, limits is limits, aren't they, guys? So the photographer's kept within the limits and of what's acceptable. I find it very strong, and uh, I'm uh, quite comfortable with my score at, uh, I think it was 93. Thereabouts, yep. I'm going to ask you to lock that in and rescore the image. You uh, locked in at 93. Yes, that's correct. Why does the magic bus keep going through my head now the, from, the, from the who? <laughs> image scores now 88. Well done. Fight for those points. <laughs> Diego, I'm going to swap you out if that's all right with Ari, if Ari's still with us. There he is, yes. Thank you very much, Diego. In case you're in wandering around the trade show, you should check Diego out and bend his arm a little bit, because, uh, next image please, because uh, Diego's actually manufactured that beautiful great big telescope sitting in the, uh, in the trade show there. How long did it take to build that? That one took a year. A year? That one took a one. There you go. Yeah. Bit, of, bit of craftspersonship there. Craftspersonship. <laughs> Thank you. Craft this is taken at Coonabarabra in New South Wales on a Sigma Art 40. You're looking at a tracked panorama, once again an HARGB 90 second exposure integration. Sorry, 90 exposure integration, I do beg your pardon. The old house was the home for a farmer and his family years ago. While the house over the years has changed so much, the sky hasn't. We can see the view he would have if he looked up every night after long days working the land. This image was captured using two cameras and identical lenses on the same tracking mount to simultaneously capture the HA and the RGB to create a full arch panorama. Thanks, Ari. Thanks, Ari. All righty, have you go, Ari. We've got the score, there it is, thank you very much. Image score is 87. And we're all very close with that one. You happy with that? Okay. In that case, I'm going to call on a comment from Mike, please. Just reminded everybody who's watching this, um, this is really, really difficult. We have so many amazing photographs that are being shown here and after you see one after the other, it's like, oh my goodness, there are so many good photographs. How do we separate them and so the finest, littlest things can come into it? So for me, this is an example I think I've mentioned in a couple of my other comments. It's really difficult when you combine a, a lifelike scene that's in front of you trying to present as a normal photograph and then also encompass the entire sky. It's a very fine line between not quite getting it right and not quite making it look real. So you don't quite feel you can be there. I have that just slight feeling with this one. Beautiful photograph, but I can't see myself standing there. That, the, the house is just a little bit too bright so it doesn't feel like night time, and that's what it needs to look like when you see an entire Milky Way so dark you can see sky glow. So again, it's a very fine line. It's nearly there. An excellent photograph, but uh, that's, that's my feedback on it. Thank you, Mike. All righty then. We have reached the end of the category. Let's just take a quick pause. Uh, pause the live stream, please.
All right, so is this the image in question? So essentially it's a thumbs up or thumbs down. Thumbs up, you want to elevate it to a finalist. Thumbs down, it stays at 89. Majority rules. So how many, just one on this one? This one. Image is now a finalist at 90. Is that the end of this category completely? Introducing ISO ColorEdge. Precision is essential for any professional working with images. Whether you're an artist, a retoucher, or a visual effects specialist, you need to know that what you see at the start of a project is precisely what you'll get at the end. ColorEdge monitors give consistent, reliable accuracy that guarantee no surprises within your color workflow. So what you see in real life is what you see on screen. And what you see on screen is what you see in real life. That's precisely why professionals all over the world trust ISO ColorEdge for their image creation. ISO ColorEdge. Discover living, breathing colour. Canson Beretta Photographique is a silky smooth satin paper reminiscent of traditional darkroom Beretta prints. 
Uh, it offers excellent black density, probably the highest on the market, uh, together with great image contrast and detail. Uh, one of the things I'm often asked is how it differs from Platine Fiber Rag, a similar paper. And it differs in two distinct ways. Number one, it, it's definitely a smoother paper, and also it's an alpha cellulose paper, whereas Platine Fiber Rag is a cotton-backed paper. Uh, now, Barita does contain some natural brightening agents, and I say natural because it's inherent in the barium sulfate coating that gives Barita its beautiful finish. Uh, but it's still considered a museum grade paper and meets all industry standards for longevity. And really it's a paper that works well with a whole variety of images, color of course, but it especially shines with black and white where rich blacks and deep contrast is important. So if you're fond of darkroom prints and you want a paper that has a rich satin finish, then Barita Photographique is definitely one to consider. The one thing I didn't realise getting into this career was how much time you'd have to spend at your desk. Emails, client bookings, following up on leads, sending out quotes. This stuff takes time. And I remember the time when everything changed. Hey Ben. No, 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 no worries. I'll, yeah, I'll be there real soon. See you in a sec. started. Hey Sarah, thanks for calling me back. Okay, I'll see you in an hour. Converting inquiries into bookings, sending quotes and contracts, keeping track of all my shoots, it's now all taken care of with Studio Ninja. Beautiful, big smile. With Studio Ninja, I never have to worry about following up on leads, chasing payments or missing shoots. Fine. Beautiful. As I said, I'm a photographer, not an administrator. So if you want to spend more time doing what you love, let Studio Ninja help.
If you're looking for the smoothest matte paper that Canson Infinity offers, then Rag Photographique is it. It has virtually no texture whatsoever with a silky smooth finish. It's a 100% cotton rag paper. It's available in several weights, including a dual version, which means you can print on both sides of the paper. And that's great for things like portfolios, art books, uh, or other creative uses. Uh, it has one of the highest DMAX ratings of any matte paper on the
Good evening, everybody. My name's Andy Campbell, and uh, we have got the Astro Deep Space category to judge now. This is astrophotography images that are out of this world that can include star clusters, supernova remnants, nebulae, galaxies, galaxy clusters, the sun, planets, comets, or the moon. Images may be taken with telescopes or camera lenses using mono or color cameras, with or without filters. Entries in this category must be taken with your own equipment using your own data, so no subscription services. Images must be taken and processed by the entrant. We've vetted these already for the, uh, any overuse of AI processing, so you're all good, and we'll give you the information, the technical data as required. Uh, with that in mind, once again, we have Dr. Tanya Hill, Ari Rex, Strongman Mike Sidonio, Paul Holan, and Diego Colinello on our panel. And we will have the first image, please. So. Beneath Victoria's pristine skies, M78 is a radiant reflection nebula in Orion, revealing its ethereal charm. Taken with an ASCAR 107 PHQ telescope, a, we've used uh, Antlia Pro filters. And we're looking at 25 red, 25 green, 24 blue, all of 300 seconds, and 180 seconds LUM exposures by 92 of them. So, scores please, team. I'd like to thank you for your patience out there in live stream land across the globe as we uh, encountered a few little technical hiccups that made us run behind schedule. But we're back now and we're uh, ready to rock and roll. If we could have the scores, please, team. We need to refresh. There's nothing happening. All right, thank you, judges. This image has scored 86. Um, sorry, I just need to look over your shoulder for a second. 88, 81, 87, 86. Okay, so we're all very even on our scoring. Let's get Mike straight up. Mike, I'll get you to make a comment on this one, please. Can you get me back to whatever page I needed to be on? Okay, first of all, I'll say um, I've seen the breadth of quality that's been entered in this competition, and it's phenomenal. These uh, final 28 or 25 images are going to be so tough. This is an excellent image. Uh, it's beautifully processed. It's got really nice shiny stars. That's what I look for in images. I want to see shiny stars. I want to see gas that looks like gas. I want to see detail that looks real, that's not overdone, that's blended in the right areas the right way. So it ticks all the boxes. It's, um, it's moody. Uh, it's a really, really good photograph. Um, and the author should be very proud of themselves. All righty then. Thanks, Mike. Let's move on to the next image, please. All righty then. So, this... Yeah, you can step off. Yeah, no problem. We, we have... They, can, they might need to borrow your device. Okay, do we have two spare judges in the room? Tim, you're up please. And do we oh, have... Oh, <laughs> <laughs> do we have Peter Eastway back, please? Okay, I'll carry on reading the description now that we're shuffling judges. So, this is Gum 65 and the bright blue star... Sig Guys, a bit of shush, please. I need to read this. Shh. Need a bit of shush? I need to read the description, please. This elegant image of GUM65 and the bright blue star Sigma Scorpii was all captured from Canberra, Australia, combining hydrogen alpha with broadband data 
truly showing the natural beauty of this lush and vibrant part of our Milky Way. This is taken with a sidereal trading 10 inch F4 carbon fibre Newtonian telescope, a ZWO 2600MC Pro, and using astronomic filters. Imaged over three nights. Exodus of judges there before, but that's okay. We've got backups. We've got spares. <laughs> By no means are these judges spare. They're fantastic. If you all need your scores, we do need your scores, folks. Thank you. There we go. All righty, straight to the finals. Ninety-one. See who scored what. Who was copying? 91, 90, 91, 90, 92, 92, and 92. While you're doing that, can I get a comment from, Doc, from Tanya Hill, please? I, I think the simplicity of this image is what really draws you in, that you just have that, the framing of the young blue star and then the beautiful gaseous, it like, as Mike was saying, it looks like gas. So fantastic job. Very quick. I moved this into the range purely for the almost like biblical symbolism that I was reading into this uh, Star of David, or it just had uh, the colour palette and design really spoke to that strongly. Very evocative. It's a great image. Next image, please. Thank you so much. All righty. The dusty wide field view of the constellation of Chameleon. The small constella constellation Chameleon lies deep in the southern skies and is home to huge dust clouds and star forming regions. Nebulosity does not necessarily have to be co colourful and the brown almost opaque dust clouds lying in the Chameleon constellations come across as beautiful as well as dark and foreboding at the same time. There are some reflection nebulae, set of lead 110 and 111, and you can also see orange V-shaped nebula below set of lead 3, 111, called the Chameleon Infrared Nebula. Lots of interesting objects. What do we make of this one, team? waiting on yours, Ari. Refresh. Thank you, Ari. This image has scored 88. <laughs> Almost unanimously in this instance. Let's call on Diego for a comment on this one, please. If someone could pass Diego the microphone, there it is. It's a great image by the entrant. Um, rarely seen dark nebulas. Um, I really appreciate the processing that this image took. In my opinion, um, it is really too easy to overprocess dark nebulas, and it, I think it would have gained a lot more if it looks more like gas than than than, than solid in, in certain parts of the photo. Thank you, Diego. Could we have the next image, please? All right, one day someone's going to tell me how to pronounce this correctly, but the Ro Ophiuchi, a cosmic bouquet. How do I pronounce that correctly? Uh, I would say Ophiuchi. Yeah. Ophiuchi. Ophiuchi. Okay, let's, let's agree on that. Ophiuchus. Ophiuchi. Ro Ophiuchi, a cosmic bouquet. This is taken on a... Guys, 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 bit of shush. Diego, uh, guys, shush. You can't talk when I'm talking, okay? Otherwise you get naughty, naughty corner. This is taken with an ASCAR lens, a 200 millimetre F4 lens. An ASI 6200 MC camera using Antlia dual band, five millimetre narrow band filter. 
5.8 hours of RGB, 5.3 hours of HO. Okay. What do we make of Rho of Fukai? You right, Ari? Do I have it? Thank you, team. This one has scored 87. <laughs> Paul, you're right on 87. Uh, could I ask for a comment from you, please, on this image? Yeah, beautiful range of colour. What I find most striking about this is this lateral flow that increases a sense of spatial depth from, from the sort of bottom right into the frame and it, it sort of makes it feel like there's a sense of movement and moving away and, and that sort of speaks to what celestial bodies do. This isn't so apparent from a still point of view. It gives it movement. Thank you. And remember that previous image that you liked? I think that's that area right there. Ah. Yeah, yeah. Cool, huh? Uh, could we have the next image, please? All righty. <laughs> oh, I love this technical term. Herget Hoffer Weinberger 1 is a large planetary nebula in the constellation of Lynx. It was discovered by Herget Hoffer and Weinberger on the Palomar Deep Sky Survey in 1980. We are looking at 55 hours of HA, 9 hours of O3, and 3.1 hours of RGB. Image was taken on a Celestron Edge HD 14 inch from <laughs> Spain. <laughs> Bregonal de la Sierra. <laughs> my name is Diego Montoya. You killed my father. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Ari, I don't have yours. Got to refresh every time, folks. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, team. No, still don't have you there, Ari. Yeah. Thank you, team. This image scores 89. We got to sort it out? What do you reckon, what do you reckon boss? Should we, we should sort it out because there's two. There's, you've got some support there. Mm -hmm. Tanya, Thank you. I am electing to challenge, so you don't get a right of reply. Oh, okay. Um, so, yeah, so this, I mean, a planetary nebula, so this is what our sun will, will eventually happen when it gets to its dying age and you've got uh, all the gas that it's sort of puffed out. And just, I think this is a beautiful shot in capturing the symmetry, this, the circular image of it, and then the colorations that they've used. I also like the effect that, to me, you could almost see that it looks like an eyeball in some ways. So I just found this a stunning image. All righty, would anyone else like to comment? Because you're all scored in fairly similarly there, Mike. Yeah, it's worth noting that, and if people who don't know, this object's incredibly faint. Mm. So to have brought it out so well is highly commendable. Um, it really is a marvelous piece of work. Scoring these images is incredibly difficult and it's really, really hard to spit the hairs. Um, the symmetry works for it. It also keeps it simple. It's a great, it's a great photograph. All righty, team. Let's uh, let's rescore this one. I challenged that, so there's no right of reply in this instance. Currently, the score is 89. You may all score it as you wish. Image remains on 89, but we've got to get a chance to talk about it. Next image, please.
Alrighty, team, we are looking at a season of Saturn, an annual sequence of Saturn images from June 2018 to June 2023. Sorry, Kay, can you scroll down for me? Showing Saturn's rings tilt towards edge on. And back up, Joe, sorry. Saturn's rings have been narrowing towards edge on during Saturn's northern autumn of its 29 year year. And this is a look at the southern spring season between, the, between this period. The cold bluish southern hemisphere is becoming more and more prominent as it emerges from a decade long polar and ring shade winter. As we approach Saturn's equinox, moons including Tethys in the final frame can cast shadows onto the planet. And we are looking at Astronomic and Chroma filters, ZWO ASI 290 camera, QHY 511 200 camera, and a Celestron C14 telescope. Does that give you all the information you need to assess this one? Ari and Diego, please. Ari, I still don't have it, mate. I'm not sure what you're doing, but it's, oh, <laughs> it's, okay. it's not working. <laughs> is it okay? It's in there now, thank you. This one is, this image scores 88. <laughs> Who's our planetary specialist here? Could you comment, please? Oh, what I really have to say is, so I remember an image from the 90s of the Hubble Space Telescope making a similar sequence like this, and I just think it is applaudable that now, with all the power of Hubble, they created something, and here our photographer's been able to do it, I'm presuming from ground base. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yes, really fantastic image. Pretty sure that's Tethys way down there. Yeah. Very cool. Thank you, team. Next image, please. All righty then. We are looking at Centaurus A, a fan fascinating disturbed galaxy in the constellation of Centaurus, 12 million light years away and some 60,000 light years across. There's a lot going on there and it's believed to be the result of a collision and merger of two galaxies. Supermassive black hole, 55 solar masses at the centre which is spewing out two relativistic jets. As these collide with hydrogen clouds, they energize them, resulting in the HA glow, which is very apparent on the north side and highlighted by the use of the HA filter. The image is north up. In processing the image, the continuum mapping process was used to subtract the red light signal from the HA. After doing that, it was clear there was a large signal from knots of gas in and around the dust lane, but more broadly through the center of the galaxy. Since the signal is clearly there, during processing, a subtle addition was allowed to permeate the core. This galaxy has distinct shells of stars, which are evident. Celestron Edge C11, SBIG 16803 camera, 50 mil astronomic filters, LRGB and HA. And I'm just looking for a total amount of data there. LRGB 18.2 hours, HA 10 hours. Get the scores in. Uh, I need Ari, Mike, and Paul's scores, please. Yes. No, we've got more now. This one is averaged eighty eight. So, you've got two in the 90s, and the rest of you are very close, so I think I'm going to challenge it again, if that's all right with you guys. Uh, I'm going to ask Tanya to speak, Tanya to speak first, I'm going to ask Mike to speak, and then we're just going to rescore it, all right? Okay. 
So, yeah, the beautiful Centaurus galaxy, what you're actually seeing is an elliptical galaxy and a spiral galaxy that have merged together. So that's why you get the sort of halo of elliptical stars and then the band across is from the spiral galaxy. And depending on how you process it, that the elliptical uh, region can actually get blown out. So I really applaud the way that they have more focused on the dust lane. Uh, and in fact, it's also setting it against those background stars is what makes it, because this image, this galaxy is very photogenic, uh, but I'm, what makes this one stand out for me is actually the background stars that they've included. Mike. Okay, that wonderful image of Centaurus A. Centaurus A is quite dear to my heart. I've imaged it many times over the years, including extremely deeply on, at times and collaborated with other astronomers who've photographed it to go very deep. So what I'm noticing here is a dark ring around the main halo of the galaxy. So for me, that's just a slight detraction. Um, I think there could be a lot more of the, inter, uh, the um, galactic cirrus dust visible in the background given the depth of the photograph. So this may sound critical, but it's not. It's just the reason it didn't quite, for me, make it into the 90s. So the depth in order to reveal that relativistic jet effect on the interstellar medium is what you see in the red there. That depth suggests there should be more depth around the outside of that main halo. The halo is even bigger than what's shown in this photograph. So they're minor things, but they're just enough for me not to give it in, to put it into the finalist category. Alrighty, team. Now, as I challenge that one, I'm going to ask you all to uh, rescore that one and score it as you see fit. Um, and I'm just going to mention that I'm with Tanya, that I think the star colours in this one are beautiful. They are really, really, really nice star colours. You guys probably all know this already, but you know, stars are born hot, young and blue, and then they get kind of big and orange as their life cycle uh, continues. So what we're seeing is all of that tapestry of time. All right, we now have remained at 88. <laughs> but we had a good chance to talk about a beautiful image. Uh, well done to the photographer, next image please. Alrighty, the Gabrielli Mistral Nebula. This is a two-panel mosaic in an effort to showcase the intricacies of the Carina Nebula, uh, paired with NGC 3324, which is the, um, the Gabrielli Mistral Nebula at the far left. Um, brightest nebula in the sky in the southern hemisphere. Uh, its core bristles with mesmerizing phenomena from towering dust pillars to compact globules and objects that have achieved fame through the Hubble telescope's lens. You can, if you look in there, you'll see the defiant finger, the mystic mountain, <laughs> and uh, Gabrielli Mistral herself, which supposedly mirrors the silhouette of the Chilean poet. Uh, this image is taken with an ASCAR 107 um, refractor. Um, we are looking at 40 600 second exposures of HA, 40 of O3 of 600 seconds, 40 of S, uh, S2, and uh, 40 of RGB. Okay, what's the scores, folks? We have Mike and Tanya in, just waiting on Ari, Paul, and Diego. There we go. We have a finalist at 91. <laughs> it ain't over yet. Tanya, I think given what we have here and the fact that you're here, could I ask you to okay. challenge this one? Well, speak to this one speak and I'll challenge it. So this is, so Ida, it's Ida Carina, right? Ida yep. Carina um, is a beautiful star forming region and a, a star towards the end there, I assume on the, the left there is, uh, so Ida Carina is actually given outbursts over its lifetime. Is that the one there? Oh, right, yes, if I get my left and right together. What drew me to this image, I'm, I normally prefer 
uh, more realistic colours of the night sky. And I think if you're going to go into the narrow band filters, as they have using the H-alpha and the, and the O3, uh, then it needs to be for a purpose. And I think the photographer has used it to a fantastic purpose in that it shows you the different... Um, you, you, so you really get the notice the differences in how the gas is moving through and also the framing of it with that line going through the centre and the red, it really is a war between the red and the blue, the cool and the hot. And so that's, that's why I think this is a fantastic image is that real use of, of taking, of not using the natural image but taking it to a different viewpoint. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Tanya. Um, Mike, you're also up there at the uh, higher levels. I'll get your comments on this one too, please. Yeah, I think um, when you're photographing something as well photographed or imaged as this object, it needs to be a little different. And what this does is, by put, putting it in that banner fashion, beautifully frames probably the best bits of this very, very famous and very, very often imaged nebula. Uh, and the comments already made about the sensibility and the colours, totally agree. So if you're going to use narrowband filters, it should show what the science is actually doing, what the emission lines are, and blended and, and faithfully recorded as this, this image does. So it's a very, very good image. Thanks, folks. As you've all been challenged by me on this one, I'm going to ask you to rescore, enter whatever score you feel is appropriate, and uh, let's sort this one out. Just waiting on yours, Ari. Thank you, Ari. We now have an average of 92. Yeah. 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 A quick judge change, Tim Moon, Ari. Guys, if you wouldn't mind swapping over, we'll give everyone a, you know, a turn. Uh, thank you very much, and we'll have the next image while that's happening, please. How cool are these images, no? How cool is this? All righty. The Heart of the Universe, Transplant Edition. This is GUM-12, discovered by the Australian astronomer Colin Stanley Gum, an emission nebula in the southern constellations of Vela and Puppis. Taken on a ASCAR 200mm lens at f4, on a ZWO ASI 6200MC using UVIR and Antlia dual band filters. We're looking at 8.7 hours of broadband, 13.1 hours of narrowband, and it's taken between the 12th of January and the 5th of February. So, let's get your scores in. Scores please, team, when you can. Thank you. Alrighty, this image has scored an average of 91. Ooh. Boom! Um, but Paul's on 96. <laughs> so perhaps you should give us the benefit of your insight, sir. Yeah, I mean, I, as a non sort of deep space photographer, a lot of my suggestions are aesthetic and emotive uh, more than technical, but. But I just feel, ah, oh, geez, it's, it struck me really, really, really instantly. It almost feels like it could be a, a menacing form of an alien energy or life coming out at me. It has this sense of dynamism. It has this amorphous sort of shape that feels like it's almost moving and shimmering um, with the subtlety and the elegance of the refinement and the edging all around it. It has a curious sense of three-dimensionality sort of wrapping all the way around it. And it's held quite beautifully by these wonderful features sort of haphazardly placed around it to, to sort of lean into that edge of, of darkness in a way. And that colour palette really speaks beautifully of that on an emotional level as well. It's an astonishing image. I'm on 96. Thank you, sir. Over to Diego, please. It's a great image of a uh, target that 
I have never shot myself, and I really consider the rendition. It's explained it. Um, all the hydrogen on the image and the rest of the gases um, are just superb. Um, I believe the entrant did a great job. Very good. Um, unless anyone else has a comment, we might go straight to scoring this one, folks. Oh, wait. Paul, you started this. Do you have anything else to add? Oh, I've said it, I think. Okay, thank you. Rescore, please, folks. While you're doing that, I don't know if you guys can see this up the back, but see this little thing up here, Herschel's Ray? That's four light years in length, they'd say. What else is four light years? Four light years is the distance to our nearest star. How incredible is it that the nearest star to our Earth is pictured as a little splash of light in this instance as a comparison? Pretty cool, huh? Thank you for um, you're locked in, because we were at 91, I think, um, and you're at 96 or 7 from memory. Nine. Yeah, so you're, you're locked in. <laughs> you're challenging yourself there, buddy. <laughs> All righty, this, this image has now scored a 91. Boom. Next image, please. All righty. Uh, M20, a rare and beautiful combination of emission and reflection nebulae, a star cluster with obscuring dark clouds and a field of glowing hydrogen in the background, sometimes known as the Trifid Nebula. This one's uh, taken from a private observatory in Chile on a plane wave CDK-17. Uh, using chroma filters in every filter combination you can imagine of LRGB and SHO. A total of 56 hours and 50 minutes exposure. Just waiting on Paul for this one. Image score is 90. Oh. Is that the average? No. Yes. That's, that's the score you've got to make. It's 89 in that case, because we have two 90s and the majority rule of three under 90. You better sort this out, Mike. <laughs> you're on 95, and uh, you're, you're obviously keen to uh, talk about this one, so please uh, pass the talkie stick. OK, well, I have the benefit of having very closely examined this image during online judging, and I really couldn't say anything about it's probably the best image of Trifid Nebula from an amateur telescope I've ever seen. And the reason is that very few amateur images have ever been able to capture that gamut of colours in the Trifid Nebula. For those who are in the audience here, we are to see this brown dust almost never, ever gets shown in an image of the Trifid Nebula. The greens, the, the, the light blues, the detail in the dust, the detail in the centre, and it all matches they haven't over, over um, sharpened the center compared to the beautiful um, soft reflection nebulosity. They've brought out an enormous amount of background hydrogen alpha detail here. The stars are beautiful. They look like stars. They've got colors in them. Like really, it's, it's a masterful piece of work in my opinion. All righty, Mike. Oops, sorry. Um, can tell you so much. I think <laughs> in this instance, we might just go straight to rescoring this one. So you're locked in, Mike, yep, at 95. Right. I'm just waiting on Paul. Thank you, Paul. Gotcha. And uh, Mike, can I get you to re-enter your 95? Oh, yes, please. All good. Image now scores 92. Well <laughs> Next image, please. Thanks, Kate. Have the details. All right. 
stellar light show, an amazing part of the sky with four emission, reflection and dark nebulae amongst a rich background of stars in Scorpius and Ophiuchi. Did I get that right this time? <laughs> the most dominant star is Antares, the orange star to the right, which is shrouded in stellar dust. Uh, data was taken from various dark sky locations over the last 12 months. Uh, using a Zeiss 135F2, modified Canon R5, uh, Hutec IDAS filter, approximately 60 panels. This mosaic is from an original image size over 200 megapixels in resolution. Oh, sorry, you've already scored it. <laughs> it took me that long to read it. <laughs> this image has scored 89. All right. And as your scoring is also very close, I think we might leave this one at 89 if that's all right with you guys. That said, I would like a comment um, from Diego. You're at 89. It's a great image by the entrant. Um, Taking with lenses and different cameras, I, I, I appreciate the, the work that it took to, to develop the image. And the dust lanes on the dark nebulas are great. Um, I would have popped out a little bit, I'll, just a slight much of uh, the rest of the colors, but it's a great rendition of that area. Thank you, Diego. Next image, please. Alrighty then, the core of IC2948, a.k.a. the Running Chicken Nebula. It hasn't changed. Hasn't changed? <coughs> um, sorry, Kay, we don't have the picture. Yeah. It's changed on this page. It's changed on here. Maybe jump out of this and refresh. We, we don't. It's not showing the right magic puzzle. Oh, okay, thank you. Well, I'll tell you more about the running chicken, but... <laughs> <laughs> We'll just refresh and see if it's going to... There we go. There we go. All right. Let's go back to telling you about the running chicken nebula. Uh, taken from a private observatory in Chile on a plane wave CDK-17, using every filter possible with uh, Chroma SHO and uh, RGB, and a total exposure time of 32 hours and 58 minutes, um, working with... Um, Red, green, blue, ionized sulfur, hydrogen alpha, ionized oxygen filters um, in this instance. Alrighty. So, what are we thinking about this one, team? Get your scores in. This image scores an average of 89. And we do have a passionate challenge there from, uh, <laughs> from Paul at 95. So take it away, sir. Yeah, there you go. Absolutely magnificent level of emotion and flow and movement and elegance and subtlety, and yet there's these lovely refined details and elements and positions of, of Christmas that you can base yourself from to then dance around this lovely, misty, flowing centre. And even the centrepiece right in the middle, if you're looking close, it, it has its own wonderful dimensionality and form that almost positions itself uh, really, really wonderfully of its own presence. So you can move all around the frame. The colour complement is magnificent. Detail is superb, and it's... Blah, 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 blah. It's amazing. 90, 95. Tanya Hill, please. It's a magnificent image. Uh, it may well be that we've just seen so many beautiful images of this region. Uh, I think is probably the only thing. Mike, do you have? I, yes, I'd, I'd agree with that. Um, this is a great, great looking image. Um, it's just originality, I guess. Is suffering just slightly for that for that reason. Um, the composition perhaps could have been chopped a bit off on the right-hand side just to give it a slightly more balance. Again, nitpicking here, but that's what we have to do at this level. These, these images are the best in the country. They're unbelievable. They're fantastic. 
So I have to be nitpicking and it's uh, then gut feeling and, and you're right, if you've seen 10,000 of these images, it has to stand out. Um, it's a really good image though and the photographer should be fantastically proud of that photograph. The uh, use of um, the, I guess, delineation here that we have of the Bok globules, the star forming regions there, is absolutely exquisite because they're often over sharpened and in this case the photographer's done an exquisite job in my opinion. Um, I'm going to ask you to uh, rescore the image. Uh, Paul, if you could re enter your 95, and the rest of you may score as you see fit, please. Well, in this, this case, it is highest one wins. This one is scoring 91. Very well. So we'll go to the next image. Do encourage you to use the full range of scoring at your disposal. Um, next image, please, Kay. Alrighty. Let's go a little bit more local in this case. This is Corona Australis Dark Molecular Cloud. NGC 6723 and NGC 6729. Taken with a SCAR 107PHQ refractor telescope, capturing the stellar theatrics of this region, we see the cosmic drama unfolding in the realms of cosmic Astra Corona Australis in the southern constellations. The southern crown cre creates a magnificent dark molecular cloud and enigmatic splotch of a canvas of twinkling stars. There's also the Reflection Nebula, um, which you'll see there as well. There's a lot going on there, folks. Thank you, team. This image scores 89. As you're also very close with your scoring, we'll remain mm -hmm. at 89 with a comment from Diego, please. Because oh. you're on 89. I appreciate pretty much the star color of the image and the fact that he, the person didn't uh, overprocess the dark nebulas on, on this photo. Um, the field of view and the framing, I think it's spot on balancing the dark nebula and, and the global, so the global cluster. So Congratulations to the photographer. An interesting mix with a globular cluster thrown in as well. Could we have the next image, please? All righty. Roses and a horse cantering beside the river at sunset. Uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm just reading what's here, it's all good. An amazing part of the sky filled with poor emission reflection and dark nebulae amongst a background of stars in Scorpius and Ophiuchi. The most dominant star is Antares. Uh, taken on a Zeiss 135 F2. Multi-panel mosaic from an original image size close to 60 megapixels. Uh, taken from various locations uh, around North Queensland. Uh, using a modified Canon R5 and a high-tech eyeglass filter. Image was taken over 12 months. I'm just waiting on yours, Paul. Oh, now. There you go. Just waiting on yours, Paul. Oh, just refresh, please, Kay. Maybe. There it is. We got it now. Average is 90. Boom. <laughs> And uh, apologies to the entrant, but this is the Blue Horse Nebula, I believe we call this one, because it looks actually like a horse's head uh, in this instance. Um, sorry, guys. All right, as we have three of you in 90, uh, I'm going to take the uh, comments from the highest one and challenge this. Um, so, Paul, go for it, please. 
Yeah, it's hard not to repeat yourself in some ways with these images, but really quite magnificent. The the space, the flow, um, the sense of sort of movement, the the wonderful separation of the hues and tones around the whole image, the little wispy sense of leading lines, leading in and out of the frame, and positions all the way bounced around that you can spend time with individually as well that collectively make up a just wonderfully cohesive tapestry. It's just gorgeous. All right. And I will quickly confess that I put a score in and then re-looked at the framing of this and how they've really kind of sat it within the thing. It's, and that's really well done. So I was actually upset that I'd, I didn't realise I'd pressed submit. And just before submit. you do score, I just want to bring you back to the title of the roses and the horse. Um, so let's go. Let's re-score this one. And I'm... Um, Letting you all rescore because I challenged that one. You can rescore it as anything you like now, mate. Right, image now scores da, 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 91. <laughs> Next image, please. Please use the full scoring range. Be deliberate with your choices. Otherwise, we're going to have a whole lot of 91s. <laughs> so. All righty. Um, we are once, once again looking at uh, the fabulous M20 Triffid Nebula. Our processing was concentrated on bringing out the detail and the core while attempting to retain a natural look. We have taken this on a GSO RC8 using ZWO ASI 1600mm uh, MM camera and uh, just with um, broadband filters in this case. It's taken from uh, Bendelby Ranges in South Australia, 280 three minute luminance and 25 of each of five minutes of RGB. Let's go. So, what do we make of the Triffid? Just waiting on Tanya and Paul. We have Paul. And Tanya, please, there we are. Bingo. This image is averaging 87. That's a solid, a solid score into the uh, semi-finalist range. Thank you. Um, let's get a comment from Mike on this oh, one, please. Triffid, you are the Triffid man. <laughs> um, I remember this um, image during online judging. Fantastic. Uh, Triffid Nebula. The stars look like stars. They're bright. They're shiny. The dust looks like dust. Um, the photographer has really kind of nailed all the basics, the star colours. It's a little bit centralised. To be an absolute top performer, the, the image from a, from a composition perspective, like when you're taking a photograph of an astro object, that may seem quite obvious that you should do that, but in this sort of competition, that can be the difference. Um, otherwise, the, the overall image is really quite good. Uh, um, I really can't say anything particularly bad about it. There's just a few things missing that could have been achieved with a bit longer exposure uh, and maybe a slightly different composition. Star colours are beautiful, aren't they? Oh, absolutely, yes. It's a just quickly? Yep. I just feel like that even though they're quite magnificent, the tapestry of, of, of colours and stars behind, they're competing quite heavily with the central feature and maybe even a little bit of subtle vignetting would, would really give the central feature a bit more voice and form. Be careful there talking vignetting to astrophotographers, bud. <laughs> well, they work pretty hard to get Lower the luminosity. Yeah. <laughs> Moving on, next image, please. <laughs> okay. All right, tail separation of comet C slash... 2022 E3 ZTF, uh, January 26, 2023, 100 by 30 seconds of luminance and 40 by 60 seconds of RG and B each. Taken on a uh, Skywatcher Esprit Refractor 100 um, from Austria. The uh, 
backstory there is the photographer endured all kinds of challenging conditions to create this image. But uh, we're rewarding the image, not the effort, so let's score this one. Just waiting on you, Mike, please. Print score is 89. We haven't talked about comets. Would you like to talk about the comet? <laughs> so I'm going to actually ask you to challenge this because uh, you're a little higher than everybody else and you've got some serious support there. Oh, okay, great. Um, so yes, so this was the Green Comet of, it was 2023, wasn't it? It was only this year. COVID has messed with my sense of time. Uh, and so uh, beautiful, I feel, imaging of, of the actual green um, ionising region there. But really what captured me is, so what happened with this comet, as they referred to, was that it started to break away. And so getting that extra in the top there, that extra little extra bit of the tail um, was what made me rank it so highly that they captured that moment of the comet actually breaking uh, up. Well, not, so not breaking up, but... Changes in space. Yeah. Yes, yeah, and so, and part of this is because of the way that the solar wind has actually affected the comet. So I'm going to ask you to rescore now, bearing in mind Tanya's remarks. You can change it. Because <coughs> that was me using my executive powers. All right, thanks, team. Print now scores, image now scores, 90. Um, wait. No, it can't. Like, it can't. That's, that's an average. That's the average is 90. Yeah, you've got to reuse that. Yeah, I've got to read that now. See, it needs to be a different colour. Sorry, um, that's 89. No, Apologies to the entrant if you're listening in Austria. Um, <clears throat> let's move on to the next image. Witch Head Nebula. The Witch Head Nebula is a faint reflection nebula illuminated by the nearby blue supergiant star Rigel. Rigel is the brightest star in the constellation of Orion and the seventh brightest in the sky. This is taken with, the, with an ASCAR 200mm left bore lens on an ASI 6200MC camera using UVIR filters and an Antlia dual band narrowband filter. The RGB is 9.6 hours, 9 hours of HA for the Witch Head Nebula. Boom. 91. As the scoring is so close, we'll accept that score. Yes. With a comment, please, from, um, looks like Tiago wants to, no, no? I was going to say Mike, but did you want to talk? Oh. No? Mike. Could you comment on this one, please? Wow. What, a, what an image, huh? Pretty incredible. I mean, the, the layers are, are awesome. The, the depth of the image is awesome. The Witch Head Nebula is one of the most fantastic uh, dusty nebulas in the sky, and the way it can sort of be set off with Rigel, brightest star in Orion there, you, you clearly get the sense that they are separated. The uh, photographers brought out the hydrogen alpha really nicely in the background. Um, I really can't fault the image other than sort of say that maybe the, the contrast is just a bit stark between the, the red and the, 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 the gas, or the dust, I should say. Um, it looks, just has a very, very slight, not quite matching feel to me, but it's very minor. And as I said before, at this level, yeah, trying to separate these images so hard, it's a fantastic shot. It's a really 
cool thing. It's just sometimes a little distracting having a bright thing right next to the edge of the yeah. frame, isn't yeah. it? So yeah. just something to, to uh, consider. Uh, just before we go on to the next uh, image, uh, Peter Eastway, could you swap over for Tim Moon, please? And next picture, please. Thanks, Tim. All righty, the Cocoon Nebula, IC5146, is aptly named. It's a magnificent nursery of stars located three and a half thousand light years away in the constellation of Cygnus. Now, it doesn't have the generous apparent dimensions of other well-known star-forming places such as Orion or the Lagoon Nebula, but it nevertheless is a seat of sustained activity of star creation, the great majority of which are hidden behind dark dust bands. The Cocoon Nebula has a bluish zone around the edge of the ionized zone, which does not result from the absorption of stellar radiation by gas and its re-emission at a lower energy, but from a simpler reflection of the light. With this image, the entrant has tried to reveal these different structures to do justice to this amazing nebula. Image was taken from France on a Takahashi TSA 102 um, using LRGB and HA filters. Total acquisition time was 37 hours. Image has scored 85. <laughs> Almost unanimously in this instance. Um, Diego, you're, you, 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 you gave it a good score. Could I get your comments on the cocoon, please? It shows a field of view that is really busy on stars, um, star color. I believe is remarkable and the gas is not overdone. Um, would have loved to see the cocoon nebula a bit, not in the center, but closer to it, to frame it differently. Um, but I think it's a great job by the photographer. Next image, please. All righty, this image is titled The Rolling Waves of Vela. Need to stand up. Okay, no problem. I'm going to bring, who have I got, who have I got back there? Tim, you're back up. And did I lose just the one? Oh, no, we're good, you got your phone, we're good. I'll carry on. This image is titled The Rolling Waves of Vela and is shot at the edge of the constellation Vela. The main bright star has no common name and is 735 light years distant. The main features of nebulosity in this image are hydrogen alpha and sulfur emissions, ionized sulfur, on the edge of the Vela supernova remnant. Uh, the image was taken with a sidereal trading 10-inch F4 telescope uh, using a ZWO 2600 camera with astronomic RGB, HA and ionized sulfur filters. We have, I was just looking for an overall uh, exposure total, uh, but you've got nine 300 uh, seconds of red, a green, similar amount of blue, 79 10 minute ex exposures of HA, and 53 uh, 10 minute exposures of SI. This image score is 90. <laughs> we have four of you at 90. <laughs> We should probably do something about that. Are we happy with, with all of that, you guys? Does anyone want to challenge it? You good? We're all, com we're all content? Okay. Um, can I get a comment then from uh, Mike in that case? Black is the Yeah, yeah. Need a pink one. Oh, it sounds like a broken record, but what a fabulous image. Um, simplicity, when you look at it closely, which I've done, Zoomed in on close because I was an online judge. The, it's so beautiful and smooth and it's the colours of the stars. It, the gas looks like it's separate from the background. There's detail in the gases. It's an unusual and original framing of a very famous nebula that normally gets photographed quite differently or framed quite differently. 
Uh, it just made me feel really good when I looked at it. Um, it's hard to sort of say how it would be better. It just felt like just very slightly it was compartmentalised a little bit. Like I wanted to see outside the frame a little bit more, but I know I can't, but that's how it made me feel. But otherwise, excellent. Really, really good. Well done. Let's uh, move on to the next image then, team. Alrighty. Mistral Mayhem, a new take on the popular region of space showcasing the many obscure reflection nebulae often excluded in images of the Gabrielli Mistral Nebula and the Gem Cluster. These are the two main objects of the field found at the top of the Great Carina Nebula. The Great Gabriella Mistral Nebula contains the Cosmic Cliffs, one of the first images taken by the James Webb Telescope. And the entrant has used PixInsight and Photoshop to try and separate the narrowband and broadband components for, to show the features of the image. It's taken from Mount John Observatory uh, using an S, uh, Sky, uh, Esprit 120 uh, refractor. It's four hours of integration time um, using astronomic LRGB and Optolong SHO filters. All filters were used in this image. Scores, please, team. All righty then. This image scores 88. Boom. I think I'm going to comment on this one because I haven't seen an image of this very popular target showing those reflection nebulae quite so intensely as that before. And hats off to the entrant for showing us these blue regions here uh, so well with these amazing uh, dust lanes giving us that very clear definition. Uh, I think they've done a terrific job of creating something quite unique in a very popular well image target. So hats off to them, good job. Um, next image, please. Uh, GUM15, also known as RCW32 in the constellation Vela, about 3,000 light years away. A beautifully detailed nebula shaped by the interstellar wind throughout. The presence of the star cluster also adds to the magic. Mostly in emission nebula, there is some reflection nebulosity present, which is seen as gentle streaks of blue magenta streaking across the nebula. This is represented in HARGB uh, over many nights from January to February using a Skywatcher 250 Quattro telescope. There's uh, 1,200 seconds exposures for the HA and 300 second exposures for the RGB. Waiting on you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. I have to refresh. Don't have Paul's score. There we go. Now we've got it. This image has scored eighty six. You're all very close with that one. Um, Tanya, could I ask for a comment from you, please? So, so with the Gum Nebula, so yes, yeah, so looking in around the the region of uh, Vela and Puppis is um, it, so whether it's part of a star um, supernova remnant, or if this is a this region, he's probably more a H two region. I think is the newest, yeah. Thing about it. Um, I suppose for me one of the reasons just to mark it down a little bit are those um, diffraction spikes, so this, this crosses uh, on the stars. You can have that with bright stars but I think it's overdone in this, this image with having all of those blue bright stars so that might be something to, uh, to have a look at. But it's a lovely image and fantastic to the photographer. Sometimes it's a little bit of the uh, result of using the Newtonian uh, telescope with the spider vane, um, but I take your point, it is a little Christmassy in that 
rendition. Yeah, so maybe whether it's um, sorry. So maybe then it's whether how you frame it and did you need to include all of the all of the stars in there may may well have helped. Indeed. Let's move on to the next image, folks. Okay. Uh, we're looking at a three-panel mosaic of the constellation of Orion the Hunter. Possibly one of the most photographed out there, and for a good reason. It has a smorgasbord of targets which I set out to capture in as much detail as possible with this three-panel mosaic. So you've got the horse head, you've got M42, you've got the more obscure nebulae such as the boogeyman and the bat nebulae here. Uh, image was taken with a Samyang 135 lens from an Astro modded Z6. Uh, in this instance, uh, 1.45 hours per panel. Thanks, Kate. Waiting on yours, Mike. We'll just keep the comments to the prints, folks, if we can. And Did you think Rude to ask what a panel is? Sorry, is it rude to ask? What a panel is? A panel. Oh, mosaic. So the photographer's taken a, 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 a frame and stitched it three frames together. Okay, this image scored 89 almost, almost unanimously um, from our discerning panel. Um, so in this case, I think I might get Diego to comment on this one, if that's all right. We won't challenge this. But we'll get your comments. The amount of information that I can see on, on, on the image, I think it's stunning. A well photographed. Lots of well photographed targets are shown there with um, stunning detail, a lot of nebulosity coming from the background and and then I can separate different places all of them I like on the on the image. I think the photographer did a great job on this mosaic. Do you think also that is it too much for the eye to see in some ways because the photographer's done such an excellent job of capturing everything there that it's a little bit of a is it a plethora? Is it too much for, uh, for, for us to assess as a photograph? It brings me to a fantasy of what if they were all that bright in the sky. Yes. And that's what I would see. Sadly, it's not the case, but that's the magic of photography. If our eyes were more sensitive, we'd look, all look up and see that, right? Yeah. <laughs> Next image, please. And the information, this is a rarely imaged dark nebulae located in the South Celestial Pole in the constellation of Chameleon. Uh, vast molecular cloud complex uh, is dense interstellar dust cloud that blocks the light from the stars behind. This region of the Chameleon molecular cloud is devoid of new star formation. It's taken with a sharp star HNT 150 uh, at f2.8. Uh, with um, LRGB filters in this case. We have a total of nine and a half hours of exposure, four hours of LUM, and an hour of each colour. So a natural RGB image taken in dark skies. Just waiting on yours, Mike. This image is scored 88. Um, just quickly on that, uh, Mike, um, I'm going to get you to quickly challenge this um, because you can yeah. and you should because you're five points away. <laughs> Go for it. Okay, what, um, what struck me about this image was the real palpable sense that the space is in way in the background behind the dust. 
we see a lot of photographs, or I've seen a lot of photographs of dust. It looks great, looks like dust and nice, but this has just really captured that fact, that feeling that the, this dust in the foot is in the foreground. And that space way behind there, looking into the distant parts of the Milky Way galaxy into infinity. And it's beautifully centered, it's like there's something's gouged out a big hole in the dust. The dust looks like dust, looks very natural, the processing is really well done, the star colours are excellent. It's just overall a really well done image. But it really captivated me that I sensed I was about to fly through that hole and I'd come out into nothing, out into it, like, you know, like from Star Trek or something, and all of a sudden all the gas would be behind me. So that's why I really think it's, uh, it's worth a, a finalised position. Mysteries play. So uh, I'm coming at it perhaps more from a pictorial angle and I get that sense, I love the explanation, um, but I wonder whether the framing and the way it's been presented to me, it's, it's confusing me a little bit because there are other areas of the image that aren't perhaps telling that story quite as strongly. And so I, perhaps I'm looking for a little bit more clarity in the way that the framing has been made to, to give me that full sense. Okay. All righty then. Um, quick comment, by all means. Yeah, what, what is, really stands out with this image for me, there's this almost visceral, organic, materialistic quality to this that feels like a, a fibre you can literally touch. Mm. And how they've resolved that is incredible. But I'm a little bit with Peter in that compositionally it feels a bit sort of unresolved and messy and kind of washes out of frame on the left-hand side, even though the, the features are so intriguing. Bring it home, Mike, uh, or have you said it all? Oh, no, I think that's all You're fair right. assessments. Thank you. Let's rescore this one, folks. Mike, you're locked in at 93. Please re-enter your 93. And I'm just waiting on uh, Paul to re-enter or to enter something. There we are. Thank you. All righty. Image has now scored 89. <laughs> and the information says that one was taken from LMDSS, which is the ASV's dark side here in Victoria. Cool, huh? Next image. Alrighty, the famous Seven Sisters, M45, in memory? Yep, the Pleiades. We have 19 hours of RGB here, uh, taken on a ASCAR ACL200 lens uh, over a period of time stretching between October and December of 2022. And I'll get your scores, please, team. Uh, Mike? Hello. Thank you. Just a phone or something. Did it come through? Not yet. Perhaps the refresh. There we go. Thank you. There we go. Now we have it. This image has scored 89. <laughs> oh, 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 my gosh. But You're on 95. Can you can and you should. I've just been following Mike's advice here. And you've, got, su you've got support. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He sees the nice Ta picture and he gives it 95, so I just do what you yeah, do. Tanya's with you at 90, and you've got some 88s in there as well. So see what you can do. So I guess I'm reacting again, uh, not as a scientist, but as a, uh, an un uninformed observer, although I have played around with this particular uh, image area myself. And uh, I, I think what I love is that, well, the other images I've seen have often been that really strong, rich blue, which we all love, whereas here it's a very mm, muted, almost delicate um, colour palette. The, the gases or whatever they are that surround, you've got that little shape up in the top right, which is sort of, you know, playing peekaboo, etc. I feel that there is a myriad of stories that we can bring so that not only you scientific types but us uneducated mortals, we can sort of get into the heavens a little bit ourselves as well. So from a purely pictorial point of view, I commend it to you. This I find is, you know, it's, it's different, it's strong and it also leaves plenty of room for the imagination. 
Well, thank you, Peter. Now, the lowest scorer is Paul in this case. You're only on 86, which is, I'm, being, I'm talking in tongue of jest there. Of it's course. a bit more consistent with Peter and I, but... <laughs> uh, I, I was sort of struggling a little bit with, with there's a sense of resolve in the image, like there, there's sort of this soft, wispy material everywhere, but it doesn't sort of resolve into a particular shape or structure or lead me in a certain direction or, or, or um, refine itself to me as, as a final piece. But I loved, I did see the peekaboo, and I, and I personally do think the, the hue on those blues is quite magnificent. Over to you, Tanya. You're at 90. Tanya. Yes, again, it's more... Uh, we've seen the classic Pleiades picture where you zoom up on just the stars, and I think this is really interesting in taking that wide field. And I also like the fact that they kept the, um, the region where you can kind of see through the, the dust and see the stars below in the bottom right there. So... It's a nice balance for me. Let's let's rescore the image. Uh, oh, I get my right of reply. I, I just want yeah. you all to sit back and imagine that image, the size of this wall, is a nice big print. Mm. Wouldn't it look absolutely amazing? Thank you. Enough said. Most, most. Well done. I'll get you to. I'll get you to rescore that one now. <laughs> You're locked in, buddy, at oh, 95. Yeah, but I, I have my computer says no. <laughs> Pleiades are known to almost all civilizations in the world. It's mentioned in the Quran and in the Bible. The, Aborig uh, the indigenous people uh, have noticed it. It's been noted by the Mayans and the Toltecs, and everybody's had a story to tell about the um, Pleiades. This one has scored 91. <laughs> Next image, please. Thank you, guys. You're doing a great job. I'll check right after this. Okay, the Large Magellanic Cloud. We are looking at 1,950 frames of 300 seconds each. Do the math on that, and I think you'll work out about... A lot of hours. Long-term project in mosaic form from San Pedro de Atacama in Chile. Uh, this is taken with a William Optics. Thank you, William Optics, our, our sponsor. Space Cat, 51. You could win one of those. <laughs> yes. uh, it's 160 hours, combining uh, RGB, HA and O3. Scores, please, team. Are you okay? There's one image to go. Okay. It's about seven o'clock. Yeah, I was just about to say. Score is ninety one. Okay, off you go. <laughs> off you go, Paul. Well, I don't know how well the audience can, can get in and really resolve themselves to the incredible diversity and individuality of every single feature in there. It has its own personality, shape, resolve, kind of feeling, colour palette. And you can dance around and spend hours with this image. And it has this wonderful helixical kind of shape sort of flowing through it. You know, we're, we're brought into the entry point with this soft kind of mist and then we're danced along this beautiful curve through the right and then we have all this lovely reveal at the back end to just spend all this time just dancing around. And I haven't seen, I guess, a sense of resolve in those shapes. Some of them look like galaxies in themselves and, and there's just such a lot of personality within personality within personality to every single point and structure in the image. It's astonishing. Tanya, you're up. You only gave it 89. This, yes, this was a really hard one for me, to, for me to judge because, I mean, the large Magellanic Cloud, so a dwarf galaxy to our, our Milky Way, and it's got the big 30 Doradus, which is just sort of to the lower left. Um, yeah, there of the, of the galaxy. 
and I can see it's beautiful artwork, but I that's I actually rated it down because it's more artwork than um, a, a sort of astrophotography. I I feel so. Yes. I have given Sorry. Up points, then. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Peter, you got something to add? No, no, I'm good. No, right. Sorry. On that case, I'll hand this one back to Paul. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, we are judging art here as much as astrophotography, Tanya. So feel free to bring that into the equation. <laughs> All right, team. Let's rescore this one. Boom, 91. All those, all those pixels, it really is distressing to see it represented as a 1 by 2,000 pixel image on the screen, isn't it? Can you see the, bar, the spiral shape here yeah, running through this one as well? It's quite extraordinary. Next image, please. That's actually the magical number of the universe and the meaning of life. Uh, this is a wide field image around Orion's belt. Uh, it's taken with a 200mm lens, on an ASCAR 200mm lens, uh, using an ASI 6200MC camera, dual band, narrow band filters. We're looking at 25.5 hours of RGB and 10 and a half hours of HO for this wide field image. Goes in, please, team. Crack that whip. <laughs> Just yours, Mike. Thank you. The image scores eighty eight. And on this one, we'll take a comment from Diego, please. Again, uh, well photographed um, targets on this image. Um, I really appreciate the way the flame nebula and the horse head and all the nebula behind the horse head is represented in here and all the nebula city between that and Orion, it's impressive. Um, the field of view, the framing, I think it's great, and the, the dark nebulosity, the, it makes the image a, a really good result. Well done to the entrant. Um, guys, thank you. That's the end of the category. Take a, take a stand up. I think we've got people who need to be places. We just need to figure out collating stuff. <laughs> And you probably need to figure out no, plugging in things. Well. Thank you out there in live stream.
Introducing ISO ColorEdge. Precision is essential for any professional working with images. Whether you're an artist, a retoucher, or a visual effects specialist, you need to know that what you see at the start of a project is precisely what you'll get at the end. ColorEdge monitors give consistent, reliable accuracy that guarantee no surprises within your color workflow. So what you see in real life is what you see on screen, and what you see on screen is what you see in real life. That's precisely why professionals all over the world trust ISO ColorEdge for their image creation. ISO ColorEdge. Discover living, breathing color. Canson Beretta Photographique is a silky smooth satin paper reminiscent of traditional darkroom Beretta prints. It offers excellent black density, probably the highest on the market, uh, together with great image contrast and detail. Uh, one of the things I'm often asked is how Beretta differs from Platine Fiber Rag, a similar paper. And it differs in two distinct ways. Number one, it, it's definitely a smoother paper, and also it's an alpha cellulose paper, whereas Platine Fiber Rag is a cotton-backed paper. Uh, now, Beretta does contain some natural brightening agents, and I say natural because it's inherent in the barium sulfate coating that gives Beretta its beautiful finish. Uh, but it's still considered a museum-grade paper and meets all industry standards for longevity. And really, it's a paper that works well with a whole variety of images, color of course, but it especially shines with black and white, where rich blacks and deep contrast is important. So if you're fond of darkroom prints and you want a paper that has a rich satin finish, then Beretta Photographique is definitely one to consider. One thing I didn't realise getting into this career was how much time you'd have to spend at your desk. Emails, client bookings, following up on leads, sending out quotes. This stuff takes time. And I remember the time when everything changed. Hey Ben. No, 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 no worries. I'll, yeah, I'll be there real soon. See you in a sec. 
That was me when I first started. Hey Sarah, thanks for calling me back. Okay, I'll see you in an hour. Converting inquiries into bookings, sending quotes and contracts, keeping track of all my shoots. It's now all taken care of with Studio Ninja. Beautiful, big smile. With Studio Ninja, I never have to worry about following up on leads, chasing payments, or missing shoots. Time, beautiful. As I said, I'm a photographer, not an administrator. So if you want to spend more time doing what you love, let Studio Ninja help. If you're looking for the smoothest matte paper that Canson Infinity offers, then Rag Photographique is it. It has virtually no texture whatsoever with a silky smooth finish. It's a 100% cotton rag paper. It's available in several weights, including a dual version, which means you can print on both sides of the paper. And that's great for things like portfolios, art books, uh, or the creative uses. Uh, it has one of the highest DMAX ratings of any matte paper on the market. That's a measurement of black density. And so it has great contrast, really nice color, and crisp detail. And it's a, it's a paper that works well on a variety of images, landscapes, uh, nature, black and white, portraits, really any image where you want a paper that has a really nice smooth finish. And so if that's the kind of paper you're looking for, uh, Rag Photographic is a great choice. Introducing ISO Color Edge. Precision is essential for any professional working with images. Whether you're an artist, a retoucher, or a visual effects specialist, you need to know that what you see at the start of a project is precisely what you'll get at the end. 
Color Edge monitors give consistent, reliable accuracy that guarantee no surprises within your color workflow. So what you see in real life is what you see on screen. And what you see on screen is what you see in real life. That's precisely why professionals all over the world trust ISO Color Edge for their image creation. ISO Color Edge. Discover living, breathing color. Canton Beretta Photographique is a silky smooth satin paper reminiscent of traditional darkroom Beretta prints. It offers excellent black density, probably the highest on the market, uh, together with great image contrast and detail. Uh, one of the things I'm often asked is how Beretta differs from Platine Fiber Rag, a similar paper. And it differs in two distinct ways. Number one, it, it's definitely a smoother paper, and also it's an alpha cellulose paper, whereas Platine Fiber Rag is a cotton-backed paper. Uh, now, Beretta does contain some natural brightening agents, and I say natural because it's inherent in the barium sulfate coating that gives Beretta its beautiful finish. Uh, but it's still considered a museum-grade paper and meets all industry standards for longevity. And really, it's a paper that works well with a whole variety of images, color of course, but it especially shines with black and white, where rich blacks and deep contrast is important. So if you're fond of darkroom prints and you want a paper that has a rich satin finish, then Beretta Photographique is definitely one to consider. One thing I didn't realise getting into this career was how much time you'd have to spend at your desk. Emails, client bookings, following up on leads, sending out quotes. This stuff takes time. And I remember the time when everything changed. Hey Ben. No, 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 no worries. I'll, yeah, I'll be there real soon. See you in a sec. That was me when I first started. Hey Sarah, thanks for calling me back. Okay, I'll see you in an hour. Converting inquiries into bookings, sending quotes and contracts, keeping track of all my shoots, 
It's now all taken care of with Studio Ninja. Beautiful, big smile. With Studio Ninja, I never have to worry about following up on leads, chasing payments, or missing shoots. Time, beautiful. As I said, I'm a photographer, not an administrator. So if you want to spend more time doing what you love, let Studio Ninja help. If you're looking for the smoothest matte paper that Canson Infinity offers, then Rag Photographique is it. It has virtually no texture whatsoever with a silky smooth finish. It's a 100% cotton rag paper. It's available in several weights, including a dual version, which means you can print on both sides of the paper. And that's great for things like portfolios, art books, uh, or the creative uses. Uh, it has one of the highest DMAX ratings of any matte paper on the market. That's a measurement of black density. And so it has great contrast, really nice color, and crisp detail. And it's a, it's a paper that works well on a variety of images, landscapes, uh, nature, black and white, portraits, really any image where you want a paper that has a really nice smooth finish. And so if that's the kind of paper you're looking for, uh, Rag Photographique is a great choice. Introducing ISO ColorEdge. Precision is essential for any professional working with images. Whether you're an artist, a retoucher, or a visual effects specialist, you need to know that what you see at the start of a project is precisely what you'll get at the end. ColorEdge monitors give consistent, reliable accuracy that guarantee no surprises within your color workflow. So what you see in real life is what you see on screen. And what you see on screen is what you see in real life. 
That's precisely why professionals all over the world trust Iso Coleridge for their image creation. Iso Coleridge. Discover living, breathing colour. Canton Beretta Photographique is a silky smooth satin paper reminiscent of traditional darkroom Beretta prints. It offers excellent black density, probably the highest on the market, uh, together with great image contrast and detail. Uh, one of the things I'm often asked is how Beretta differs from Platine Fiber Rag, a similar paper. And it differs in two distinct ways. Number one, it, it's definitely a smoother paper, and also it's an alpha cellulose paper, whereas Platine Fiber Rag is a cotton-backed paper. Uh, now, Beretta does contain some natural brightening agents, and I say natural because it's inherent in the barium sulfate coating that gives Beretta its beautiful finish. Uh, but it's still considered a museum-grade paper and meets all industry standards for longevity. And really, it's a paper that works well with a whole variety of images, color of course, but it especially shines with black and white, where rich blacks and deep contrast is important. So if you're fond of darkroom prints and you want a paper that has a rich satin finish, then Beretta Photographique is definitely one to consider. One thing I didn't realize getting into this career was how much time you'd have to spend at your desk. Emails, client bookings, following up on leads, sending out quotes. This stuff takes time. And I remember the time when everything changed. Hey, Ben. No, 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 no worries. I'll, yeah, I'll be there real soon. See you in a sec. That was me when I first started. Hey Sarah, thanks for calling me back. Okay, I'll see you in an hour. Converting inquiries into bookings, sending quotes and contracts, keeping track of all my shoots, it's now all taken care of with Studio Ninja. Beautiful, big smile. 
With Studio Ninja, I never have to worry about following up on leads, chasing payments, or missing shoots. Fine, beautiful. As I said, I'm a photographer, not an administrator. So if you want to spend more time doing what you love, let Studio Ninja help. If you're looking for the smoothest matte paper that Canson Infinity offers, then Rag Photographique is it. It has virtually no texture whatsoever with a silky smooth finish. It's a 100% cotton rag paper. It's available in several weights, including a dual version, which means you can print on both sides of the paper. And that's great for things like portfolios, art books, uh, or the creative uses. Uh, it has one of the highest DMAX ratings of any matte paper on the market. That's a measurement of black density. And so it has great contrast, really nice color, and crisp detail. And it's a, it's a paper that works well on a variety of images, landscapes, uh, nature, black and white, portraits, really any image where you want a paper that has a really nice smooth finish. And so if that's the kind of paper you're looking for, uh, Rag Photographique is a great choice.